Welcome everyone to the third day of the International Obsidian Conference 2021. This is getting to the point, Wari Obsidian Distribution Reduction and Use in Southern Peru, uh, in the Southern Frontier, on the Southern Frontier by Dr. Donna Nash. Thank, thank you so much. Um, I'll be presenting a paper getting to the point, so I'll get to the point. Obsidian was mobilized in a special way by the Wari Empire during the Andean Middle Horizon. Previous research has identified the sources of obsidian distributed through imperial channels of circulation, which supplied Wari enclaves and may have been traded to contemporaneous polities such as Tiwanaku. Geochemical techniques can track the movement of obsidian across the Andes, but it cannot elucidate how this resource was managed and processed as it traveled between locales of acquisition and its eventual users. Materials recovered from Cerebaul and Sierra Mejia, two settlements in Moquegua on the southern frontier of the empire, more than 500 kilometers from the capital, form a sizable assemblage to make inferences about the distal links in this chain. Items from households, ritual offerings, and two production locales demonstrate that the frontier province of Moquegua received preforms rather than nodules with cortex for use by imperial citizens. This manner of distribution may have been typical of multiple provinces, especially those without obsidian sources or a history of obsidian use before Wari incursion. Obsidian may have been processed in the Wari capital and perhaps a few other facilities near sources before it was distributed to provincial elites. One type of Wari obsidian point has a diagnostic shape found throughout the empire. I suggest that these classic Wari laurel leaf points are diagnostic bifaces because they derive their general form from the processing of cores or large flakes into preforms for distribution. On the other hand, smaller triangular points also fashioned from obsidian were made from flakes removed from preforms through efficient bifacial reduction. These are more variable in form and resemble local points made from other materials. In this paper, I describe the process of obsidian reduction in Wari's southern province. I detail the evidence from the palace on Serbaul as it may be a Wari technology. Studies of the Wari political economy have focused on decorated pottery and its use for feasting. Obsidian acquired and distributed through formal imperial cha channels probably reached a greater proportion of the populace than Wari decorated pottery, at least in Mukegua. Thus, the study of obsidian, its reduction, distribution, and use offers a new data set for understanding the articulation between communities and Wari provincial agents throughout the Andes. The Wari polity stretched from Cajamarca in the north to Moquegua in the south, a distance of some 1,100 kilometers. The capital was in the central Andes by Cucho, Peru. Wari political expansion was materialized during the seventh century CE by the construction of provincial centers, changes in settlement patterns, and the introduction of new artifact styles. Since the Wari empire is a prehistoric polity, determining its size and strength relies on material culture. In broad strokes, the assemblage associated with the Wari archeological culture consists of distinctive or canonical architecture which may be executed using different materials, but is consistent in form and the organization of space. Ceramic styles are also important, but can be equivocal when iconography is the basis for inference and attributes of technology, locales of production and manner of distribution are not considered. Somewhat unusual and perhaps unique to worry as an Andean complex society is the very diagnostic and widely dispersed classic worry laurel leaf point. This unique aspect of the Wari assemblage begs the question, why? Why are the points diagnostic over such a large area? The relatively similar appearance might be understandable if these items were prestige goods, symbols of power with a limited distribution, like the Darian mace heads, perhaps they were made as weapons with fancy versions used to display wealth and authority. This possibility, however, is not supported by the corpus of representational art. Powerful people of supernatural or supernatural entities are not depicted holding spears. Instead, axes and spear throwers are common. Figures are shown with smaller dark points on textiles and pottery at the ends of arrows and atlatl darts. 
smaller triangular points are more suitable for darts or arrows. Most examples of wari laurel leaf points are too large for darts or arrows. Obsidian points of all forms are used as offerings in ritual deposits. Outside these contexts, retouch flakes affiliated with edge maintenance are found in domestic settings and clustered in hearth ash, which indicates a quotidian household use. Many points exhibit asymmetrical use wear consistent with cutting or shaving, although some examples could have been used for darts. Obsidian was not reserved for weaponry. That is clear. If that were the case, then Sarah Mejia was a community of soldiers, each of whom maintained their own weapons. I prefer a scenario where women used obsidian to perform domestic tasks and sharpen their tools as needed. Despite Berger's early revelations about the relationship between obsidian and the warry polity, most scholars focus their attention on ceramic styles to make interpretations. Geochemical sourcing has shown that pottery of high quality that closely matches what is found in the imperial core, as well as more modest items, previously considered derived imitations, were both produced locally using similar materials and techniques. This diagnostic form of some wary obsidian points, I'm sorry, the diagnostic form of some wary obsidian points could be explained in the same manner. However, sources of obsidian are fewer than sources of clay and provided the empire the opportunity to channel distribution through nodes in the political hierarchy. This type of control can never be absolute. Large complex polities cannot control the activity of all its citizens. No doubt some obsidian would have moved outside the imperial network in ancient black markets supplied by outlaws and smuggling. Given this caveat, the features of worry laurel leaf points, other obsidian points and tools, the size and type of debitage, all provide clues to understand how obsidian moves through the empire and was processed along the way. Since the worry empire could control the movement and processing from the source to its ultimate destination and households, it is a significant line of evidence to chart the polity scope and the strength of the relationship between nodes and the imperial network. Geochemical analyses have identified the sources of obsidian and variation within them. And we learned about that on Friday. Of primary importance were Kispasisa and Alka, as well as Shavai, which was also used by Tiwanaku. Tripsevich and Contreras' study at Kispasisa reported primary and assay flakes on the surface near quarry pits with little evidence of advanced stages of reduction. Likewise, Jennings and Glasscock reported little evidence of reduction at sources of alka obsidian. This suggests that nodules were removed from sources in most periods without much processing. Settlements covered with reduction debris have been located in the vicinity, but have not been studied. Nonetheless, some inferences can be made based on materials found at different sites. Studies of obsidian artifacts and production debris from the Wari heartland show that some cores were transported there. Cortex was present on tools from Vegetai Komoko, a central sector of the capital, and Conchipata, a site 12, 12 kilometers from the city. Both studies found materials with cortex. The majority of pieces analyzed were larger than a quarter inch, a result of the screen size used during excavations. At Conchipata, Bentec found that 18% of obsidian flakes and shatter had some cortex. Kaplan found a slightly higher percentage of flakes with cortex among her sample from Vegetai Moko. This pattern is not replicated in Moquegua, where only four pieces with cortex has been observed in analysis of over 2,000 pieces. This sample includes smaller pieces of reduction waste, points in production, finished tools, and preforms. Located in the Trada tributary of the Osmori drainage, Sarabawa and Saramahia are adjacent hills occupied by worry affiliated households that form two sectors of a low density urban center designed to represent dual organization, a trait common to later Andean sites such as Inca Cusco. Sarabawa is a mesa with monumental architecture on the summit and clusters of modest terrace dwellings on its flanks. Saramahia is a steep, dome-shaped hill that follows the same general pattern. The low swale between the two hills was occupied by irrigated agricultural fields. The site was occupied by worry-sponsored frontier colonists of diverse origins and local people drawn from the middle and coastal valley. 
Obsidian has been recovered from every house excavated in the Bawamihia settlement cluster, but the types of items recovered differ between the two sites. On Sarabaul, the sample I discussed comes from the palace, located on the summit's eastern end. The, the palace had personnel adept at reducing preforms to points, and debitage is present in several rooms. On Sarabaul, I excavated the house of a specialist who shaped points, possibly in service to their neighbors. Debris from sharpening or edge maintenance has been found in all houses. Some classic worry laurel leaf points in published photos appear to be preforms. Preforms can be recognized by irregular profiles along their length and uneven surfaces, whereas a point or finished tool should have a relatively straight profile along its length. Preforms are transformed into points through removing flakes of various sizes. Points reduced from preforms are relatively thin, have straight profiles, and maintain the leaf shape. On the other hand, smaller triangular points for the most part, can be made from flakes removed from preforms. They are byproducts derived from preform reduction. Hence, they are slightly bent in profile. The preforms serve as cores for flake removal, but end their use life as points or knives. This manner of reduction sequence requires skill and technical knowledge. People who do not know how to reduce a preform may use it as a tool. Also, personnel with access to an abundance of obsidian may not choose to reduce it in an efficient manner. Thus, the features of obsidian tools and debitage at a site may provide clues to infer access and participation in the imperial network of distribution. On Sarabaul, two large preforms were found, one on top of the other, in a construction offering under the floor of a room in the palace. These pieces are on display at Museo Contesuyu, although I was permitted to study these specimens one afternoon in the dark exhibition hall. Both exceed 90 by 60 millimeters in size and have sizable flake scars from the removal of pieces large enough to make small points or other tools, the largest of which measured 30 by 30 millimeters. The Sarabawul Palace assemblage provides many examples from which to infer the reduction sequence of preforms, which could be used as multi-directional cores. Flakes removed from preforms were then shaped into triangular points most of which could be fashioned from a flake 30 by 30 millimeters in size or less. Flakes of several shapes could be used to make points. Short, wide flakes were often selected. The bulb of percussion would be oriented to one lateral side of the base. The flake was often polished to create a rough surface resembling frosted glass. Early in the process, the bulb may be removed if it was overly thick. This appears to have broken some points in process as one side is often missing from unfinished points. Detailing of edges was not finished until the bulb was reduced and the base was shaped. Pressure flaking was used to shape flakes into triangular points and maintain obsidian tools. Deer antler tines were found in the palace and were recovered from one household on Saramahia. Sarah Mejia has a greater number of pieces. However, the majority are retouch flakes or small, small thinning flakes or shaping flakes. Points run small. In contrast, specimens from Sarabaul include preforms, large and small points, flakes of sufficient size to make points, as well as thinning and shaping flakes. To date, no preforms have been found on Sarah Mejia. In general, more modest houses on the slopes of Sarah Mejia have smaller points or the only evidence of use in the structure was the presence of retouch flakes. This pattern supports a model of distribution where most obsidian originated from state channels of circulation. I suggest that large preforms with little to no cortex were delivered to elite governors on Sarabawa via imperial channels. Flakes may have been removed before they were transferred to subordinate elites occupying the summit of Sarabawa. These subordinate elites may have also engaged in this type of skimming. Elites charged with the supervision of commoners, such as those on Saramahia, distributed these items to clients in small amounts, perhaps at events with feasting to mark occasions of calendrical import. Distribution of this kind may have fostered a patron-client relationship while avoiding the broader distribution of items like decorated pottery that held a higher symbolic value. Clients may have received nearly exhausted preforms, flakes, or small triangular points. Obsidian is ideal because it is consumed as it is used, although households could reserve obsidian for exchange or ritual offerings. 
If this was the case, obsidian may be a better indication of community connection with the Wari Empire than decorated pottery. The appearance or increase of obsidian resources in an area during the Wari era may stem from a state institution that distributed obsidian to create relations of reciprocity or in debt clients to state-sponsored patrons. I suspect there was more to the Wari political economy than feasting alone. Context is important. Areas with an abundance of obsidian or communities without the technical skill may have followed different methods of reduction and use. However, in zones where few pieces of obsidian arrived before Wari incursions, such as Mokegwa, the prevalence of obsidian debitage in households and particularly the presence of the diagnostic Wari laurel leaf point probably indicates participation in imperial channels of exchange or incorporation in the empire's political economy. As people attending this talk on a Sunday, for which I am very grateful, are well aware, lithic artifacts have a significant story to tell about the scope and strength of the Wari Empire and other complex societies. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you, Donna. <clears throat> Are there any questions? Yes. I have one. Mm -hmm. A nice presentation. You. Uh, as you know, at the in the arrowheads, the weight is important. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you have the weight? Uh, oh yes. So at Cerebral and Ceramia, I don't think that we have any pieces that are arrows. I think we have a few things that might be at lateral darts. I did have an occasion to look at materials from Tiffany Tung's site at Baringa. And I think she has arrow points, um, but I don't think any of the materials that we have are small enough for arrows. Okay, uh, how do you think about the, how it specializes, what the process of the nut? Okay. Um, so you're asking me how specialized point production was? It, okay. Yes. Okay. So I don't I don't think that um, every household would have had the skill or someone with the skill to reduce a preform to a point. Um, I do have indications for all stages of that process in the palace. So the palace on Cerebello, which is the most luxurious house in my sample of almost 30 houses that we've excavated um, had someone who knew how to do that. Um, however, on Sarah Mejia, where I've excavated um, over 20 houses, only one of those houses indicates the kind of debris associated with the whole process. Um, and so I think that um, it would have been a specialist that, that performed that task Whereas um, a greater proportion of the population would have been able to say, sharpen a tool and maintain the edge for using it um, in the household. I hope that answers your question. Uh, okay, thank you. I, I understand the production of uh, reforms was made for one uh, group of people and the Finnish napping of the arrowhead was finished for other people? Um, so I don't think anything is an arrow. And I, I try really hard not to use the word projectile point. I mean, we all see like a triangular thing with a tang and we think it went on the end of some weapon or hunting tool. But I really would like to advocate that we look at these tools critically. And I think that the majority of the pieces I have are domestic use. They were used for cutting. Most of them are found in kitchens. The debris like from use is all in kitchens next to hearths. Um, and so I think that I do have some atlatl darts in the palace, but they're the exception and not the rule. Um, and so I think that in the palace, preforms are coming in and they are able to reduce them into tools of their choosing, whether those are knives um, for kitchen tasks or darts for atlatls. Um, on the other commoner 
or the Marmata site of Sierra Mejia, I think that they're um, all for kitchen tasks and, and people are receiving probably flakes that, that can be shaped into other tools or points. And if they want a point, they have to take it to the neighbor, the specialist who will make it into a point for them if that's what they want. Um, but, you know, they may choose to just take that flake and use it as a flake. You know, you, you don't really need it to be a triangular point to do a lot of stuff with it. So um, I hope that clarifies the, the assemblage. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Donna, do you do you find them in burial contexts? So we don't so, have burials. Um, <laughs> uh, all all of our um, graves are looted except for those of uh, three children, three babies. We have three babies in the adolescent that aren't looted, and they don't have points with them. But we do have um, this pattern where you'll have two points included in a ritual offering all over the place, like under floors or on top of burnt offerings or next to burnt offerings or along with pot smashes. Um, so we that most of the points that are kind of nice are from those kinds of contexts. Mm -hmm. I wonder when the um, representation of obsidian on iconography began, uh, you mentioned Wari, it's, it's definitely happening in Nazca. And of course, that's on the way to, ESPC says on the way to Nazca, mm -hmm. Ayacucho. So. I, I did find a representation of a, what could be an obsidian spear on a Paracas textile. Mm -hmm. And I know that there are Paracas objects that have really big obsidian points on them. Like, I think there's some sacrificial knife I found. I can't remember what museum it's in. Um, but I, I think that by the time we get to worry, we're not having like big spear points on the end of spears. I, I if anybody's aware of one, please let me know. But I, I did do a thorough search of the literature for that. Um, I wonder, you mentioned early reduction on at the Fari sites. I wonder about Alka because, you know, Kurt, Dave's here. He might, he might know the answer to that the presence of early reduction at Alka, or, or maybe it falls off at a certain time period. You know, the, mm -hmm. the archaic sites have it and the later sites don't, early stage or later stage reduction that is. <clears throat> right, yeah. I mean, I, I think that there is some early stage reduction going on at the Capitol. Um, there's nothing to rule out that there wouldn't have been a site kind of between the source and these major trunk roads that we talked about on Friday mm -hmm. that's doing some of that reduction. I'm not suggesting that they all went to the Capitol and then back out. However, I, I do think that the, you know, that a lot of this, this reduction, that the empire is mobilizing it and controlling the flow and they're not carrying nodules all the way out to Sarabaul or other provincial sites. They're reducing it into a standardized form before it moves. Mm -hmm. well, I, I like your your idea about the the affiliation, sort of cultural affinity with obsidian in the kitchen, um, as showing that you're part of the Wari community. Mm -hmm. uh, because and that might especially be true to the north, where there's fewer sources where everyday herders don't have access to, you know, another source, like up at Paco Pampa or someplace with no other sources. Right? <clears throat> yeah, I was, um, John Topic kindly shared with me a picture he had of a Laurel Lives Point from the area around Cerro Amaru. And he told me that the area is just covered with obsidian points around Cerro Amaru. They're just like all over the ground and that farmers will collect them and sell them to tourists. And so I would I would be really excited to maybe go look at things from the northern end of the empire and see just how similar they are in terms of their reduction and that kind of thing. That would that would be very cool. That would test my model essentially, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Does anyone else have questions? I would say, uh, Nico, speaking to Alka, 
Um, they did find, I think, like 13 uh, large warty bifaces at Espiritu Pampa that were composed of ALCA-1. So there is some, you know, initial reduction into these bifaces from the ALCA source that are going out. So not all just Kispasisa. Mm -hmm. Oh, in fact, like, I mean, I'm working with Dave and Ryan on this, and I took a look at it this morning, and most of this stuff is ALCA. Oh. Um, but my specialist workshop on Sara Mejia has a bunch of the minor sources too. So that, that'll that be interesting to explore. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, there, there was a large collection of, um, of five faces from Marco Wamachuco that Ule okay. had found. And then the others were found by, by John and uh, as my recollection, I, I ran some of that stuff. My mm -hmm. recollection was there was both Kispisis and Alka together, even though they were both bifaces. Cerro Amaru is a weird site, you know, it's, it seems to be heavily um, involved in the ritual of, uh, of, of the North. Uh, so I, I'm not sure what the original context of all that obsidian is. It, mm -hmm. it may not be normal household debris, it may be sort of a more special context. In yeah. contrast, you know, Marco Wamachuco has a greater diversity, I think, of, of functions, but no one has ever made it clear where the obsidian comes from at that site. But my impression was that it, at Marco Wamachuco, they were already um, completed bifaces. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, and then there are those ones that um, from um, San Jose de Moro, where there are also a large number of completed bifaces, but I don't think there's any debitage. And mm -hmm. that, that seems to be a, a common pattern, like a spirit to pompous is another case, but I think there are many cases. So, I mean, the, the role of, the, of these large obsidian bifaces in terms of state symbolism and in relationship to Wari ritual, I think is, is, a, is a really interesting subject that sort of complements what you were describing in terms of the daily household usage mm -hmm. of obsidian. That was a great paper, by the way. Thank you. Yeah, so the um, these bifaces or preforms, I showed you the two largest ones, but a lot of the um, pieces in ritual offerings are also kind of unfinished. I mean, I, I just, Maybe I'm assuming too much, but I think that if they're going to be symbols of power or people are going to display them, that they're going to make them look a little nicer than they look. I mean, they, so I, I think it, they might, you know, be offerings as in like raw material wealth, as opposed to kind of finished um, tools. Um, so that that's something that I kind of want to push forward is like, it looks like the smaller points are getting all the effort. Um, especially things that might be darts or symmetrical, they're balanced, they'll fly. If you try to put some of these other points on the end of something, it's going to go cockeyed off into some random other direction. And so um, I do think it was primarily distributed as some kind of commodity um, to in-debt clients as opposed to being like these symbols of power. Well, thanks everyone for coming on a Sunday. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Donna. Um, is Rodrigo Esparza here? Um, I guess we have a few more minutes before Matt's talk. If, if anybody wants to chat about Donna's paper more. Donna, wasn't Sarah Baul reoccupied at some point later during during the conquest or am i mistaken about that so there is evidence that a few of the rooms were cleared and used as barracks during the war of the pacific hmm. um and and we do find bullets in a few places um there might be a bullet from baul i know i have two bullets from sarah mejia uh but the the palace doesn't seem to have that kind of disturbance. We do have two or three intrusive Inca offerings that we found in the upper strata of the palace. Um, but my analysis 
I excluded those materials. So I really focused on things in intact contexts um, and direct contact with the floor in areas that weren't disturbed. So there are many more obsidian pieces in the area that I excavated as the palace, but this sample really like limited and excluded things that might be disturbed. Quick question if it's okay. Uh, mm -hmm. I just want to ask you, have you tried to refit some pieces in the in the layer you showed the the one which was the yellow yellow obsidian you indicated so it it, it for me it was seems like really in situ layer and and uh, have you tried to somehow just to refit some pieces or no. or it doesn't have any any logic idea well i i guess i mean i don't even wash them <laughs> <laughs> the idea of like gluing them together horrifies me. Um, sorry, that's like, I guess, an old world thing. Um, <clears throat> but I also, the that yellow debris, like I made it yellow so you could see it, right? It's yeah, normal yeah, gray obsidian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, <laughs> I figured out how to do that in Photoshop. I was so delighted. Um, anyway, uh, I think they're like too tiny even. And and we have the sourcing data, like Dave Reed has recently like went through and taken some of the bigger pieces there and tried and sourced them. And that debris that you saw comes from like eight different sources. Yeah, and so I, I really, yeah, I don't I don't know if it would even be possible to try that. Understand. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. The clear material, was it mostly Alka or Kispisisa or Chivai? You know, I, isn't much Chivai there. We do have a few pieces of Chivai, like um, maybe like 10 between the two, you know, between the sample we've XRF'd, which isn't nearly as large as the sample that I analyzed. Um, we, I was trying to find, because on Friday we were talking about how sometimes people like obsidian just because it's pretty. And so our pretty obsidian is the clear with like the tiger stripes. Like we have quite a few where they'll make the point so that it's diagonal and the tiger stripes go this way. Um, but the, the pictures weren't very, there are older pictures that are a little blurry. It, it actually takes some skill to photograph obsidian and I've, it took me a while to figure that out. Yeah, those are great photos. Um, Backlit, is that how you did it? On glass? No. Um, I actually just had Cyrus Benacosmi do it. So I just found the right person to oh. take the pictures. I haven't done it. Um, we do have quite a bit of clear material. Although um, the clear stuff is in the brewery more. Mm. And so it may be that they favored it and that it was higher value because the, br the brewery does have like more luxury goods than my sample from the palace. And the brewery is also later in time. Um, so I haven't had a chance to look at the materials from the brewery, but I have looked at Ryan's photographs of the materials from the brewery and there are a lot of clear points from the brewery. Ours are more of the gray tiger stripe. Um, the red stuff is very rare in the palace, but we do get um, maybe 20% of the material on Mejia might be red, maybe 15, 15 to 20% has the red um, coloring on Mejia. So they were reciprocating with, with beer then for their obsidian. You know, in terms of the color, um, yeah. Hey, have you seen the red color on any other source material besides key species huh? in, in, the, in your sample? So um, I just got the spreadsheet from Dave, like, I don't know, two weeks ago, and I didn't go through and match up the pictures of my points to the sources yet. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. I can't answer that right now. Hey, Richard, this is Kurt. Um, a large area of the Alka, one out, uh, outcrop has the mahogany or the reddish yeah. obsidian, or, or occasionally it's red and black marble. Uh -huh. That's mm -hmm. the source area. And we have seen artifacts made of it, but I, I don't know if they're wary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And 
What other colors? Brown as well? Black, brown? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, the, the, the brown stuff, um, reddish brown, black, clear, black and clear, striped. Yeah, that's about it, I think. I think early on, we really had high hopes of visually sourcing things when it was expensive and we didn't have XRF. And so Ryan and I went through and purposely picked the different colors. Um, this probably was materials we sent to Mike Glasscock for INAA like a long, long time ago. Um, and we have there was no correlation between color and source. You, you can't do that. Yeah. It'd be nice. And there's no green obsidian from Peru either. Yeah, <laughs> I haven't seen any. That works I remember, well, um, right? you know, when I when I was first starting the obsidian project in, in the early '70s, it was just an idea, and I was with Ro, who never liked the idea to begin with, and. Um, I found a piece in, in the excavations of uh, what looked like a green flake and I knew about Pachuca. And so I said, oh my goodness, this is, this is, maybe, maybe they have green obsidian in Peru and Ro just laughed at me. He said, oh, that's just beer glass. I said, well, you know, don't jump to conclusions. You know, I, I think I'm gonna, you know, run it back in Berkeley and say, okay, do what you want. <laughs> you know? So I took it back and we ran and it was beer glass. <laughs> he really liked that. <laughs> Pilsen Kayal, I think it was. <laughs> There's some black chert, and I've heard rumors that it's coming from Puno, that people have run as obsidian and it's come back as, as chert. So we, we have to be aware of that, that there is some chert that, that people get fooled and think is obsidian. Mm -hmm. but hopefully no beer glass. <laughs> All right, well, it's 9.40 here. So uh, let's go ahead and move on to the next paper with Matt Boulanger, Nicholas Tripsevich, and Richard Berger uh, titled Digitization and Preservation of Legacy Datasets, Continued Adventures in Salvage Archaeometry. Can everyone see my slides now that I'm un unmuted? Uh, developing out of the, the scientific advancements in chemical and nuclear research uh, as a result of essentially the production of the nuclear bomb uh, in the 1940s, uh, geochemical analysis of obsidian uh, in many different ways is now kind of a standard aspect of most archaeological research in areas where obsidian is available. If you're like me, who did most of my archaeology in the eastern portion of North America where there is no obsidian, uh, all of this is kind of moot, uh, but at least where obsidian was used by our ancestors, we can analyze it and often do uh, with all sorts of projects, whether it's academic projects, research projects, compliance projects, et cetera. Essentially, anybody with the funds can purchase an instrument today uh, and produce geochemical data with obsidian. And so there's been a, a decentralization away from uh, large government funded laboratories over the past 30, 40 years uh, and kind of a, a democratization of data production. Um, in this kind of environment where the production of new data and, and despite what lots of people would like it to be, archaeology tends to place a prime value on new discoveries and new data, there's oftentimes not a lot of incentive or motivation to revisit old data. Um, but I'm, I'm weird and, and I like to work with old data. Uh, and so uh, a number of years ago, I began a project uh, focusing on old data. And this is kind of a follow up to some ongoing uh, kind of pursuits in that direction. Uh, and I hope to show that not only are old data useful, uh, but we can actually learn things from the process of working with old data. And so to kind of guide you through where, we'll, where I'm gonna be going today, 
Uh, I'm going to give you a brief introduction of the Berkeley Laboratory, the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory, not the UC Berkeley Laboratory, uh, and a short discussion of the efforts that have gone into preserving data from that lab. Uh, and then I'm going to kind of shift to, to focus on a specific example, and that in that example is Richard Berger's Obsidian data um, that he generated, as he just kind of was talking about, beginning in the early 1970s. And then I'm going to kind of conclude with uh, what I think are some of the lessons that we can uh, learn from this project uh, and how we can use these data today. So if you don't know, um, the, the nuclear archaeology program at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory was one of the first generation archaeometry laboratories in the world. It was one of the, uh, the longest uh, serving, but it was also one of the initial ones, along with a couple other ones at Brookhaven, uh, the University of Michigan, and several others. It operated between 1960 and 1980, or sorry, 1960 and 1990, uh, and it was initially conceived by Iz Perlman, uh, who was a nuclear chemist at Berkeley, um, as a way of making use of nuclear technology and nuclear advancements in a peaceful way. That is something other than killing lots of people. Uh, and he was able to convince his student and ultimately collaborator, Frank Asaro, uh, to join him in this project. And you can see them here on the screen. Uh, Frank is young uh, uh, and handsome. Uh, is, is is the older gentleman sitting down, pointing at the pottery. And they were assisted by a nuclear chemist who also worked in the laboratory named Helen Michael. Uh, Betty Holtzman here was a student who was going to be doing some research on, nu on uh, pottery as well with the laboratory. Uh, is took retirement from Berkeley in the early 1970s, uh, at which point he moved to the university, or Hebrew University in Jerusalem to found another archaeometry laboratory. I guess it always makes me kind of uh, self-conscious that I haven't done anything because here's a guy who's fun, you know, founded, not only did he work on the atomic bomb, but he founded two archaeometry programs in his lifetime. <clears throat> When he left Berkeley, uh, direction and management of the lab passed to Frank and to Helen. Uh, and in their kind of efforts to continue, especially in the 1970s and 80s, continue working to explore peaceful applications of nuclear technologies, uh, the nuclear archaeology program at Berkeley essentially set many of the kind of standard uh, practices that we use today. Uh, for example, uh, establishing an in-house uh, ceramic standard uh, that had been doped uh, with different elements to make it appropriate for analyzing archaeological pottery. Uh, also, the establishment of standard materials for the analysis of, obs of obsidian. In this case, the uh, number of Mesoamerican sources were used in each run to kind of as, as maintain quality control. And lastly, uh, the laboratory was really the first one to work directly with archaeologists, as I'm sure Richard can kind of attest. Uh, but throughout their lifetime, Frank and Helen saw themselves as the specialists uh, in the laboratory and with the production of data, uh, but they needed the archaeologists to kind of give them good questions and material uh, and direct their efforts. This process or these, these kind of standards uh, persist today. If you look at the Murr Laboratory uh, with Mike Glasscock and, and the Oregon Laboratory with Leah Mink, uh, this, this kind of co collaboration between the, the laboratory specialists and the archaeologists is, is kind of a standard way that we approach things. <clears throat> Uh, so between 1968 and the closing of the Berkeley reactor in 1988, uh, the nuclear archaeology program analyzed by neutron activation at least 12,000 specimens of archaeological, geological, biological interest. Um, and research continued after the closing of the lab uh, in, a, in a way that might shock many of you if you've never worked in a nuclear facility uh, where the samples were shipped to the Missouri University Research Reactor in Columbia, uh, where Mike Glasscock would put them into the reactor, make them radioactive, uh, they would be removed, and then they would be shipped cross country, so while they're still radioactive, uh, back to Berkeley uh, for counting uh, there. Uh, so they were still producing data even after the Berkeley reactor had closed. 
And this continued until Frank Asaro retired in 2006. Uh, and at this time, uh, he was asked to basically clean everything out of the office and make, make space for somebody new. Uh, and he contacted Mike Glasscock at Murr uh, and asked if Mike could come out to Berkeley and, and basically take possession of all of these materials uh, that were left in the laboratory. Uh, these materials, as I've talked about uh, elsewhere, and as uh, Frank and David Adon Bayowitz talked about in 2007, uh, these materials included paper records, uh, surplus samples, uh, microfiche, uh, photographs of materials that had been analyzed. Uh, basically, all of the, if you look around laboratories, you know, that exist for 20 or 30 years, all of the stuff that accumulates over time. His goal in kind of transferring these things was to ensure that they uh, continued to be useful, that we could continue to work with them and publish on them and find new information within them. And so uh, I had just arrived at the Murray Laboratory a year before this, and Mike Glasscock re returned in 2006 from Berkeley, uh, and I had just helped him uh, kind of do a similar project with uh, neutron activation data from the University of Manchester in England. Uh, and so he walked into my cubicle one day and dropped about uh, 12 or 15 uh, huge FedEx boxes of stuff uh, such that I couldn't even leave my cubicle when he did that uh, and, and asked me to take care of it. And so between 2006 and 2015, when I left Murr, uh, I basically oversaw the digitization and transcription efforts uh, for these archives. Um, Within three years, so by 2009, we had managed to, to digitize and transcribe and scan all of the records that Frank had, had sent to us. Uh, and these efforts uh, kind of revealed a couple of very interesting things. Uh, first was that they only contained data pertaining to the neutron activation program at Berkeley. There was no XRF data uh, and no other kinds of data produced by other techniques. Uh, and second, those archives that he sent uh, only contained about 50% of the neutron activation. Uh, they had estimated in 2007 uh, that they had analyzed about 10,000 archeological samples and 2,000 plus samples that were geological and then some other things. Um, but the records that he sent only had about half of that, about 4,500 or so uh, pieces. And so after 2009, uh, I spent a good deal of time trying to track down uh, in, in very Sherlock Holmes fashion uh, data anywhere that I could find it, whether it was uh, in publications, uh, whether it was in uh, the garages of people who used to collaborate with Berkeley uh, back in the 70s. Uh, I even traveled out to, to Jerusalem and went to Haifa as well. Uh, because several of the former collaborators were working there uh, and found stacks and stacks of, of printouts of data uh, that ultimately came back to Missouri. All of these uh, by 2014 had been transcribed and with the help of digital antiquity and the digital archaeological record, uh, all of these data, the scanned uh, notebooks, the handwritten notes, uh, the transcribed data, uh, everything from the neutron activation program that we had located at that time is now on TDAR and can be accessed, accessed uh, by anybody who, who would like it. For those familiar with the Berkeley program, um, you'll, you'll recognize that they're probably most, most famous for analyzing ceramics from the Near East and the Mediterranean. Uh, but it's also important to point out that about 10% of what they analyzed uh, comes from the Americas, uh, about 6% in North and Mesoamerica and about 4% from South America. Um, and most of these data have never been published. Uh, kind of keeping with that, uh, Richard uh, and Mike Glasscock have both recently published a book chapter based on an SAA session from a few years ago um, that actually makes use of some of the NAA data of South American pottery that had been analyzed very early uh, by the laboratory, but had never been published uh, else. Again, nobody had, had returned to look at it. Uh, and so despite being 40 plus years old, uh, those data are still being worked with and still relevant and highly compatible uh, with MER neutron activation data today. So the neutron activation data is, is pretty good. It's, it's, I think it's in a good, good shape right now. We haven't identified and located all of the data, uh, but we've got about 95 to 97% of it. 
Uh, if you happen to be sitting on some and would like to share it, uh, I'm, I'm happy to, to take it in. Um, but I'm going to focus on the XRF data because nothing that Frank sent uh, to Murr at the time had XRF data in it. So there's a large portion of the, the work that was done there uh, that's missing. And just as they made significant contributions to the development of neutron activation, uh, they did the same with XRF, uh, especially with Obsidian. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, the Berkeley Laboratory was one of the first, if not the first, uh, laboratory to produce a highly portable, uh, rapid scan, uh, high resolution XRF spectrometer for use in specifically archaeological collections and, and conditions. Uh, you can actually see it here on the screen. Uh, the 1967 version is there with somebody holding a piece of, uh, it looks like a spear point in front of the detector while it's collecting data. Thankfully, um, the times have changed and we're a little bit safer now. Uh, but the, the 1969 iteration, two years later, is sitting on the, the, um, the, the shelf there, the tabletop behind uh, Jay Walton. And you can imagine it doesn't look highly portable by today's standards, uh, but this is the granddaddy of them all. You could literally carry that into the field or to a museum uh, to collect data relatively quickly. Despite, as I mentioned, despite the importance of the XRF uh, program at Berkeley, we don't have any of these data. And most of our efforts have focused on the neutron activation data. Uh, we have, in over the course of the past few years, found some of these XRF data. Uh, Tom Hester here in Texas has sent me the, the Texas Obsidian Project, a project he worked with for the past 40 years or so, uh, collaborating with Frank, trying to source obsidian that's found here. Uh, we found some Mesoamerican obsidian data that's been published, uh, and then some uh, Near Eastern pottery. They experimented with that. Um, but most of the actual data are, are simply not present. Um, but the Berkeley records that were sent do contain an item by item list of every single sample that they analyzed, uh, whether it was by neutron activation, by wet chemistry, by XRF, by whatever. Uh, so we actually have an idea of what is out there and where it comes from and who sent it, uh, but no data. For a number of reasons, uh, Richard's uh, Andean Obsidian Project is probably uh, one of the largest and, and uh, most appropriate kind of things for this, uh, this kind of work, in part because Richard is still around and is willing to share uh, those data. In fact, um, uh, between uh, about 19, Richard can correct me if I'm wrong, but the first kind of publications of the XRF data and the NAA data from the Andean Project uh, began coming out in the 1970s uh, and up until about 1994, uh, Berkeley continued to analyze material for this project. And over the course of that time, uh, they analyzed over a thousand artifacts and source samples uh, from South America, both by neutron activation, XRF as well. Uh, the neutron activation data is, had already been transcribed uh, and is already digital. And so uh, we aren't terribly concerned about, you know, we, we've taken care of that component. Um, but we're interested in the XRF part. Um, most of the obsidian comes from archaeological sites in Peru, uh, Bolivia, and Ecuador. Um, and I think it's important to clarify because I was talking with a colleague earlier uh, a few weeks ago who, who, who said that Richard only began doing work when he was at Yale uh, or that Richard did his XRF work in the geog geology department at Berkeley. Uh, and I would refer to anyone who, who, who's kind of confused about that to go back and read the publications from 1970s, from the 1970s and 1980s, where it's pretty clear uh, that he began in the geology department, but found the rapid scan WDXRF there to be unsuitable for what he wanted to do. Richard's data uh, and project working with the Berkeley Laboratory essentially set the stage for future obsidian sourcing projects in South America, Andean South America in particular. Uh, they used a combination of XRF and NAA to identify the sources of materials, uh, but because most of the sources had not been identified uh, on the ground, they first started identifying and classifying types of obsidian. And much work has gone into this and built on that initial foundation to begin to identify the, the geological sources of these obsidian types. Uh, as, as Richard talked about a few days ago, these, these efforts still continue. 
Uh, in fact, uh, he, he introduced or talked about the association of the rare one type with the Charania source. Uh, and as we'll see by the end of this, hopefully in the next few minutes, um, it can continue to be built upon. So in 2018, uh, Richard sent a paper case box filled with photocopies and original data printouts to Nico. Uh, Nico contacted me, uh, and over the past few years, we've basically been working to uh, uh, digitize these data. This is what they look like. Um, for all of you who, who think that the, the Bruker Tracer 3 uh, uh, interface with Excel is difficult, um, this is an 11 by 15 inch dot matrix printout uh, of data. Um, not digital in any way, uh, so we have to make it digital. So we've got it pretty easy, even, even if the way that we have it easy is pretty hard. Uh, each page has the sample ID at the top, in this case, BUR160. Uh, the number next to that, 8031, is the collection of, uh, is the run or the assay. Uh, H is the position in that assay. Uh, and then there's some descriptive data stuck on the side of there. The, uh, catalog number is CS5, the site is Chupas, uh, it's from Ayacucho, and it dates to the early intermediate period. That's pretty straightforward. On the left and the right hand side of these, we see the elements of interest. So each row represents an element of interest. Uh, and what we're probably most interested in is the data, uh, the quantified elemental abundances. And you see those here on the far right side of this page. Uh, so iron here, the, the concentration is 4.721, uh, plus or minus 0 0.066. Uh, and then we have a base 1 million exponent uh, that both the concentration and the error have to be multiplied by to make sure everything is in parts per million. Fairly straightforward, but let me tell you that transcribing this will give you carpal tunnel syndrome uh, in your hands. Uh, but if we want to make use of the data, we have to get it digitally. Uh, it's not particularly conducive to, to digital ways of doing this, that is scanning it and having it text recognized um, because of the way that it's laid out. So after a few years, we got everything digitized uh, and all told in this box, the data, uh, data for about 470 specimens from about 60 archaeological sites uh, in Bolivia, Peru, and Ecuador uh, are present in the records. Uh, nearly all of these are from Peru, uh, specifically southern Peru, although there are some samples from Chavin um, that are present in there. And some of the kind of key publications that correspond with these data uh, are listed at the bottom of the screen. Asaro et al. 94, Berger et al. 94, Berger et al. 2000. Uh, we're going to focus on whoops, uh, mostly the Peruvian and Bolivian obsidian. Um, primarily just for brevity. Uh, it all told, uh, the Berkeley XRF program analyzed or quantified about 21 different elements. So on each sheet, there's uh, uh, concentrations of 21 elements. Uh, and then there's another sheet that corresponds to a, a different assay uh, where they quantified barium, lanthanum, and cerium. Um, but of these 21 elements, at the time when they were published, uh, Frank and, and, and Richard felt that only rubidium, strontium, zirconium, barium, and cerium uh, were sufficiently accurate and precise to publish. Uh, and as we'll see, uh, the data actually bear that out. Um, now, useful for us is that each of these assays contains at least one analysis of the Perlman Asaro standard pottery uh, or a well known obsidian source like El Chayal or Ishtepeque or something like that, um, so that we can uh, compare them to other laboratories. And that's what you see here is a direct comparison of the Berkeley uh, data for, for eight different elements. Uh, compared to the MER neutron activation or the MER XRF data uh, for the same obsidian sources. Uh, you can see the relationship is more or less linear for most of these. Uh, there is greater error certain, uh, associated with some of the elements. For example, manganese is just not worth looking at. Um, and niobium is pretty poor as well. Uh, but the key elements, rubidium, strontium, yttrium, and zirconium, uh, tend to look pretty good in direct comparison. Uh, we can still, uh, we would have to, to uh, modify them by an intra-laboratory uh, correction factor, uh, but they're, they're pretty good. Surprisingly, uh, you know, this, this 
uh, now antique instrument uh, um, that was produced in the 1960s and 1970s uh, still is pulling its weight in part because of the, the time spent calibrating and, and, and building this instrument and the time spent making sure that data were actually good data produced from it. If we just look at the data in a kind of standard bivariate plots, uh, we see the subgroup structure uh, of all the different sources that are present in the data. Uh, there's a handful of samples here that we haven't or have not been able to assign to a source yet, um, but you know that, that's kind of to be expected. Uh, only about four or five out of the the 470 or so couldn't cannot yet be assigned to a to a source. Um, so what could we learn? Well, uh, you know, it, it's fun to work with old data, uh, but also uh, I would point out um, that there's a couple of things we can learn from this. Uh, for example, the rare three type that was identified by Richard and Frank. Uh, we can actually compare this to current the current MER database, uh, and when we do, it appears to match uh, the recently identified Serosa source um, identified a few years ago from samples from uh, Ice Tsurumi, uh, one of Richard's colleagues. Uh, so we can actually uh, use these data to start pinning down some of these unidentified materials. Uh, and I would also point out that there's a small. Let's see if I can do this correctly. Uh, there's a small source, uh, subsource here. It's kind of hard to see, uh, but over here, it's a little bit better, it's lower barium uh, than Kispasisa and a little bit higher zirconium uh, that seems to kind of stand out in other projections of the data. Um, so it's potential, uh, potentially, um, there might be other smaller subgroups in there that had not previously been recognized. Um, so. Uh, where are we at? About half of the, the Andean obsidian data from Berkeley uh, has been uh, digitized uh, and can be made available for researchers. Uh, we can still learn from these data in terms of new current archaeological research and continuing to build uh, off the, of the work of Richard and Frank's uh, um, earlier publications. Uh, but we can also learn a little bit about how to preserve data for ourselves. Um, for example, um, all calibrations are not equal. Just because an, an instrument arrives from the factory and it says it's got a calibration on it, uh, that doesn't mean uh, that it is directly comparable to other instruments and to other calibrations, as, as Rob talked about yesterday. We, as the users, have to produce calibrations that are comparable with other laboratories if we want our data to, to outlast us and to continue to be useful. Uh, I would also add that we should be including standard materials uh, with every assay so that there are data available. Don't just shoot your source once uh, or every time you get a new instrument, uh, but include the same materials in every run so that when, um, you know, in 40 more years, uh, if you come looking for me and you ask me to, to work with these data, uh, this is the kind of information I need to make sure or people like me because I'll be dead, uh, people like me will need uh, to make use of your data and to preserve it. Uh, I would also point out um, that we should be storing our data, not just digitally, but also on paper. Uh, as Steve and I were talking about a few days ago, uh, Berkeley uh, government funded laboratory had a mainframe computer with mass storage. Uh, but by the time the laboratory, the, the archeology span program closed, all of that equipment, even though the data were still stored there, uh, the equipment, the hardware obsolete, could not be read. The Berkeley Laboratory did not have the facilities to read uh, stuff that was from the 1960s or 70s. Uh, and even if they did have the hardware, you would have to have the software. And so while we might think of, oh, well, the internet will solve all that, we don't know what's going to happen in 40 years, uh, let alone five years. And so digital storage is great, but I would also encourage people to, to consider uh, printing out their data on acid-free paper uh, with each project uh, or reports for each thing and making sure those data are available in open access repositories uh, because um, you never know uh, when, when bad things are going to happen and you're not going to be around to explain to people, oh, these data are from that project, right? Um, the history of working with these data from many different laboratories has taught me, if it's taught me anything, it's taught me that People die unexpectedly, uh, and once they do, so much institutional knowledge goes with them uh, that it's oftentimes almost impossible or very, very difficult to reconstruct that knowledge. 
uh, last slide, the research at Berkeley was funded in by uh, very several different iterations of what is currently the United States Department of Energy, uh, as well as the UC Archaeological Research Facility uh, and the Museum of the Central Bank of Peru. Um, I should thank uh, I.C. Tsurumi and Mike Glasscock for sharing the Cerosa data. Uh, I have to thank Digital Antiquity for providing the funds to, to, and the space to store uh, all the NAA data associated with this. Uh, and um, all of the collaborators uh, that worked with Richard and Frank and Helen over the years, uh, and specifically Frank uh, and Helen for having the foresight uh, to, to really focus on developing good calibrations and good instrumentation uh, to make sure that these data will outlast them uh, into the future. And I'm gonna plug uh, Nico's uh, uh, talk next, which is the Indian Obsidian Geochemistry Project where uh, I hope that all of these data will ultimately make themselves or, or find themselves uh, in the future. That's it. Thank you, Matt. Are there any questions or comments? If, if there's time, I, I have a couple of comments I could make. Is there time, Nika? Yeah, we have a break after my talk, so I imagine it's okay. I, would ju I just was going to say, you know, very quickly that, um, you know, in terms of putting this in historical context, that um, Frank Asaro um, really actively sought my involvement in this. You know, he deserves all the credit because I, I actually never worked with any of the geology departments. Um, I, I started, I was inspired by Mike Coe when I was an undergraduate at Yale, but who was working with Bob Cobin, but um, in Mesoamerican stuff. But when I got to Berkeley, I wanted to continue to do that kind of work. And Bob Heiser had a, a really old, old fashioned um, XRF that had a lead, um, protective shield that you had to do manually. And he agreed to let me use it after midnight um, on samples. So I would work between 12 and four in the morning and I kept forgetting to use the lead shield. You know, so I was, it was, it was, it was a worrisome thing. And um, so I gave a talk at uh, the Department of Anthropology at Berkeley and Frank came to it and he said, oh, that was a really great talk, Richard, but it's all wrong. Um, you know, you, the machine you're using is insufficiently, you know, precise to, to do what you want to do. Why don't you come up to LBL and we can work together? So that was really how it began. It was that Frank, you know, in, came down from LBL to anthropology to invite me to do this. And so, you know, it's, a, it's all, I give him all the credit in the world. He's a great guy and a wonderful scholar. Um, but he wasn't an archaeologist and he accepted this. And I kept trying to train him to refer to fragments of obsidian as like flakes or artifacts or five, but he, but he kept calling them shirts. I was never able to, you know, cure him of that. You know, for him, it was, uh, they were all shirts because he had started with ceramics. Um, and then I, just one other minor thing, which is that the reason why we got into the XRF in part was specific to Berkeley. Um, that I wanted to use all the samples from um, what then was the Lowy Museum and is now the Hearst Museum. And, but many of them were, were whole um, bifaces or uh, other artifacts. And so I didn't, I, you know, for the NAA, we had to grind everything up and make them into pills. And I couldn't really ask um, the Lowy to let me do that to all their uh, biface collections. So, um, Really, the XRF was in part designed to, to deal with that specific issue. And part of the reason behind it was to increase the sample size, obviously, but it was also to see whether there were um, anomalous chemical compositions that might allow us to pick up new sources or rare types. Um, so we would go through after each run to see if they fit into the eight major categories, if there were ones that might not. And in those cases, we would try to run them by neutron activation. And uh, that way we tried to sort of maximize our sample variability in the kinds of obsidian in the central Andes.
it's interesting, Richard, that so much of the the stuff that they analyzed early on, nineteen you know late nineteen sixties in in through about nineteen seventy five, came from the Lowy now the Hearst or uh, other museums. So so I was looking at um, uh, the Penn Museum and they have a bunch of cuneiform tablets and each of those tablets or some most of them have little holes drilled into them. And that's exactly how, how Frank and, and Helen would extract powder from pottery to minimize the destruction to them. Uh, but so much of what they analyzed came from you know, museum collections, at least initially, because I think that they didn't really, as you said, Frank wasn't an archeologist. And so they didn't really know how to formulate a, a question of interest to archeologists. And so that was like, they, the, the, the great thing about it is they recognized their own kind of ignorance and said, you know, we need, <laughs> if, we, if these are gonna be useful things, we need archeologists to, to, to help us. Um, and I think, I really respect that. And I think it's, you know, coming, it, having the, 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 the wherewithal to admit where you, where you have your blind spots is something I think we could all learn from. Thank you, Matt, and thank you for your efforts over the years to make sure these legacy data remain available for um, future researchers. So the next paper is presented by me and it's authored by myself, Michael Glasscock from Murr and Eric Kanza from Open Context. And it's titled, Building on a Repository of Obsidian Geochemistry for South America. I'll go ahead and share my screen. So while Matt Boulanger's talk was concerned with legacy data, this next talk is concerned with making sure our analyses um, that we're doing today will be available to people 50 years in the future by using principles from open data science that I'll be talking about. <clears throat> so today in 2021, it has been nearly 60 years since the onset of archeological geochemistry work. And, and now precise and portable X-ray fluorescence instruments are improving access to artifact geochemistry by broader groups of users. <clears throat> At the SA in 2019, we introduced the Andean Geochemical Visualization System, a collection of obsidian geochemistry uh, collected, conducted at the uh, University Research Reactor at Missouri and hosted on the Open Context Repository uh, connected to a R-Shiny based uh, visualization system. So the a key aspect of the system that we're using that is that it's built on open source software that can be hosted on the web and archived with data sets um, with no licensing issues so that it, it will be available for people in the future. Focusing now on South America, we currently have 1,053 data records analyzed by NAA hosted on this open context repository. And I'll be giving a brief demonstration of this R Shiny system, which is a, an R, a JavaScript wrapper for the R statistical package. And it supports, currently it supports only basic biplots, and, uh, but it runs in a web browser. And then I'll, after that, I'll show an alternative approach that I've been putting together that involves Jupyter Notebooks. So the problem we're trying to solve is the following. There are too few mechanisms for distributing reliable digital data today. Sometimes new publications emerge that don't even have, that still don't include digital data sets. And second, there's a tradition of publishing summarized data instead of the whole data set. And, uh, and maybe this is due to the you know, printing limitations of, of the paper printing format, but today there's no particular reason not to include the whole data set. And finally, we are focused here on using this free and open software that can be included in repositories and that makes data exploration more accessible to people. <clears throat> the basic workflow is the following. One conducts analysis using say ADXRF and generate a calibrated um, results in comma separated values table. And these can be uploaded to a this web app. And then the app will plot these results against ideally obsidian source sample elemental concentrations from the same XRF 
in the same lab using the same conditions, but you know, perhaps by another XRF, if, if you know, calibrated to the same standards, if, if your own lab hasn't, doesn't have access to those source samples. And finally, if none of those previous uh, are possible, then um, we provide reference data generated from neutron activation analysis and uh, accessible through the open context repository. The system will show data points against ellipses for the source samples or ternary diagrams currently. <clears throat> the presentation today is an example of data sharing infrastructure that clearly depends on adequate training and instrumental calibration. But while there's, there's weak support for a lot of this type of infrastructure today, um, there's an there's a associated but um, separate problem, which is that a lot of these instruments aren't directly comparable. And we heard from Rob Tycott earlier about um, the, the, different, the, the different chemistry he's, he's uh, determined using different instruments in his same lab. So that's a little bit, um, a little bit of a pessimistic view on this, but we'll, uh, assuming that we can improve, start over. Our presentation today is an example of data sharing infrastructure that clearly depends on adequate training and instrumental calibration. Today, there's currently relatively weak support for data hosting and sharing among geochemistry analysts. And there's also these issues of inter-instrument comparability. So while these are these are related, they're two separate challenges. And here we're primarily concern, concerned with the first, that is data access and supporting linked access between web repositories and apps that, are, that provide visualization. These, these apps also, are, these, these repositories also make clear the, the, the research history and make citation of the uh, original researchers easier because you can track the, the um, origin of these data more easily. The one issue that, we're, that we will you know, encounter here is that we're, we're describing a method where you're comparing NEA reference data with the new data generated on artifacts from XRF. And there's, there's a few issues with um, doing this type of comparison. Assuming that your XRF is calibrated to, uh, to match neutron activation analysis when possible, um, for example, using the MER40 sample obsidian set that, um, that the MER facility will send out upon request. The, another issue is that number of elements are not available to both NXRF and NAA. I thought I would describe these here. Rubidium is available in both, and it's generally very useful. Barium and strontium are only available when the parts per million exceed 50 determined by NAA, and that's because of the, the calibration, the, the current conditions of their neutron activation analysis system at MER. Um, zirconium is available, but only when uranium doesn't interfere. The zirconium peak by NAA is a combination of real zirconium and uranium fission product that, that produces zirconium. So for samples with low uranium, real zirconium is relatively high, and the fission product contribution of zirconium to the zirconium peak is not significant. But when zirconium is low and uranium is higher than five to 10 parts per million, the fission contribution starts to become significant. Uh, Mike Glasscock, co-author here, says the correction is extremely complicated. And for that reason, he doesn't generally use zirconium values determined by NEA to identify source. Um, this is particularly true where uranium is, is present. <clears throat> so, Thorium is available, but only in the L lines in XRF. Zinc is not an incompatible and silicic melts, and therefore you get a lot of variability in zinc values from XRF. And uh, man manganese is right adjacent to the, the iron peak. So it's somewhat overshadowed by that iron peak. And <clears throat> ad additionally, it's next to the, the area filtered out by the green filter from Bruker. So we, we have some issues with using manganese there. So at this point, I'm going to demonstrate, I'm going to play a, a video demonstrating the 
a um, current system that's based on R Shiny. Now Shiny is a JavaScript wrapper for, for the R statistical package that's produced and managed by the R Studio people. So you may have heard of the Tidyverse and R Studio. So Shiny is in that same um, group and um, therefore gets good support from them. <clears throat> However, it's it's somewhat um, limited as you'll see. It only does buy plots and you never really see the R. It's for people who don't want it to see the code at all. This is a demonstration of the geochemical visualization system available at the UC Berkeley Archaeological Research Facilities website under the research menu. This is a R shiny based system that will plot on a by plot system here um, tables of elemental data from an instrument like an X-ray fluorescence device. The um, system is preloaded with neutron activation analysis data from the Missouri University Research Reactor and uh, provided by Mike Plaskoff. Now, ideally, you would compare X-ray fluorescence artifact data with sources anal source samples analyzed by that same instrument under the same conditions. But in cases where your instrument is calibrated to match the MER um, elemental results and you do not have source samples available, or perhaps you don't have a full suite of those source samples, the data is available to, um, to compare with. So in this example, I'm going to be looking at sources from Peru. So I'll switch over to Peruvian obsidian sources and artifacts are from Southern Peru. So I'll choose some of the sources in the region to compare with. Uh, if you'd like to see the different elements, here is, these are elements that are typically available from X-ray fluorescence. So you can change the elements along the axis there. And if you'd like to see the points that are used to construct these ellipses, they're available here under options. So in this example, I'm going to upload ex the uh, X-ray fluorescence data that's provided in this example file linked here. Um, as you can see, there's a unique ID column, the first one. Second column is a grouping variable like site ID or source ID. And then the subsequent columns are elements. There are no spaces in the field names in the top first row here. So I've downloaded this file to my desktop and I'm going to upload using this button, there it is. These are Peruvian artifact examples. So I've chosen artifact, the sample ID column, we have to tell the system what is in each column. So the sample ID is the first column, the source ID is the second column, or the site ID in this case. And then the elements, let's use rubidium, strontium, yttrium, and zirconium, or, or columns number eight, nine, 10, and 11. I'll choose those from the list. Seven, nine, and 11. And I will show it in the plot. The sites are available, visible here. And they have, they're differentiated by color. Now, sometimes it can be hard to tell the ellipse colors but one way to, to determine which green is this, you know, the ellipse in question is to click here in the legend and it will turn on and off. So that one looks like it's Serra Ticlago. And this one is Chivai. So let's assign these artifact samples to Chivai. And we can click here on the rows and confirm that we're looking at Chivai samples there, they're highlighted. And so I'll go ahead and type Chivai in the notes column. And you can go ahead and download that table. So as I mentioned, it's best to analyze the, um, the sources with the same instrument, but these are available in case you're working outside your 
regular study area, or you just don't have all the sources analyzed on that instrument yet. And your instrument is calibrated to match MER results when possible. So next I'd like to um, show you where this repository, we are using open context repository here, opencontext.org. You can see they have a lot of data from North America in the form of the DINA data set, um, a lot of uh, East, East Mediterranean. In this case, we have our data set in the Andes is this dot and you can jump straight to the records or look at the cover page of the project. Um, there it loads up, it shows you all the names of the researchers over the years who have contributed data to MER, samples to MER for um, neutron activation analysis that are included here. And let's go look at the records. The um, map is shown here and we're gonna use this as a geo browser to zoom in and select our study area. Uh, the sample artifact data today it comes from Southern Peru. So I'll zoom into Southern Peru. Um, I'm going to show the circle markers. And, and when we get in closer, I'm going to delimit using this tool, our study area, to only consider sources in the region around the, the site. And as you can see, we're, we're, we've zoomed in, and now it updates. And we're looking at only 330 records instead of over 1,000. Um, you can see these records down below here. We can click on one. and. <clears throat> see the full record, all the NAA chemistry provided. Um, and we can download all of the 333 samples by clicking on this button. And there's all the elements that are gonna be included. We can exclude some this way. And you can export CVSV or GeoJSON with this button. Um, also wanted to mention that when we are um, using these data connected to a web app, the, um, the API supports copying the URL and pasting it into the web app. And um, right now they're undergoing some upgrades, so the API call isn't working, but that, that's ultimately what we'll do is just zoom in, make sure the data records are updated, and then take the URL over to the analysis environment. So now I'm going to demonstrate the uh, Judy, the Jupyter Notebooks, which are these, it's basically, as I um, showed here, this is Julia, Python, and R in a, um, available in this web browser interface. The, <clears throat> the, uh, this example notebook is an R notebook, but it runs from here from this Jupyter Hub, which is hosted at UC Berkeley. But these notebooks, you'll see them more and more. They're becoming widely used and um, supported by Microsoft, by Google. In Google, they're called the Collab Notebooks in Google Drive. And those are mostly Python, but they'll run R as well. And um, I mentioned Microsoft, uh, ArcGIS Pro has notebook support added on now. So they're running their Python um, so we'll see them more and more. They're also really good for teaching because the students can just sign into this web page. They don't have to pre-install things and, uh, they, and the code is visible and the results are immediately shown below. So here we've run this first cell with the libraries, our libraries we're gonna be using today. And I'm just holding down shift and moving through this notebook. We've libraried the, li the, those packages and now this is where we would put in the um, URL for that 330 source sample um, delimited area on open context. But because right now the, the API won't support that, we're um, just gonna pull it in from CSV. We can look at the data, this is the format. And then I'm, this next cell defines the, the size of the plots in line. And now we're gonna plot rubidium against zirconium in this case, using ggplot. Now, one of the most useful ways to represent these source data is as two standard deviation ellipses. So instead of showing the actual points, let's show the data ellipses. Well, you can't show data ellipses when there's fewer than, than three points to use because you know, an ellipse around two points doesn't make a lot of sense. So, we're gonna um, filter it 
here we're going to add a count for each chemical group. And that's visible here on the end, the N column. And then we're going to create two data frames. One is the ones with fewer than three, three or fewer samples. And the other is called NA lips, has more than three. And you can see them here. There's two data frames. And now we're going to plot the ellipses for the ones that are eligible for that. And next, I'm going to use this JavaScript library called Plotly to create a dynamic plot. So recall how in the R Shiny example, you were able to move around and zoom in. Well, similarly here, we can zoom in, we can turn on and off ellipses like so. And wouldn't it be nice to overlay our artifact data on this plot? So here we're, we're going to pull in the artifact data from the CSV. Um, we're going to add the chem group variable so that it overlays on this, has the same structure as the other data frame. So they're compatible. And now there they are overlaying on ggplot. And now I will load them in the, um, the, the plotly example. And you can see how these, these uh, artifacts are around the Chivaya ellipse. And the, uh, although we're seeing more variability in rubidium among the artifacts, so maybe there's more rubidium variability at Chivaya than we currently have in the Murr uh, collection. So let's look at the artifact data. You can see these, um, the, you can look at the, the top six rows but this is sort of a static view. So I wanted to show you that there's other data table representations like data table here. And this one allows you to sort columns. You can slightly more dynamic in that way. Finally, I wanted to show you what a ternary plot looks like. This is also using Plotly. This one is zoomable. So we can zoom in on these kind of tight clusters and pull them apart. And looking at ratios on the X and Y axis and Y plots, it's as simple as adding a slash, you know, divide by in the, in the code here, just like that. And then we're gonna display it in Plotly. And there it is, rubidium over strontium. So that's a quick introduction to Jupyter Notebooks using R. Um, I was going to quickly show you over here, we have a Jupyter Notebook with Python. And in this case, we've, we've got a few um, graphical views of the data. So here's, here's, a, uh, here's a Python map using Folium. And so you can take the same data and represented in maps. And this is also possible in the R, in the R notebooks using libraries like Leaflet. So <clears throat> in conclusion, I um, would uh, like to point out that this is based on uh, open software that can be attached to the websites, the repositories where the data is hosted. It can also be Include it in a container or a, you know, basically the, the software, the libraries, the repository, all of the, the entire analytical environment can be containerized and archived. And someone 50 years from now could would have access to all of the all of the above in order to reconstruct your analytical environment completely. Um, secondly, I wanted to highlight that in, in these, following these principles of open data science, software like Excel, while it's good for exploring your data and you know, showing it in JMP and kind of looking for patterns in your data initially, in terms of producing a workflow that you know, you're moving samples through these instruments and generating a lot of data, you wanna have a explicit workflow using the text-based um, statistical package like R and Python, and, um, and then of course, many of the commercial software like SAS also use text. They have a text um, terminal, but 
those are commercial, so you have licensing issues if you were to try to archive it with your repository. So we'll see more of these night notebooks in classes and in analytical workflows in the future, and I wanted to um, share them with the Obsidian community here today. Finally, um, one of the key aspects of the open context repository is that it doesn't require that you're signed in beforehand. That is, it's possible for apps like the notebook and web our shiny app to pull from that repository with no sign in headaches because that really restricts the accessibility by these um, sort of ex external visualization platforms. So when you're looking for repositories to host your data, consider that. that it, that's one of the issues with TDAR is that they require that you're signed in beforehand. Open Context doesn't, eScholarship does not. There are a number of them that don't require sign-in. They, they do generate metrics using other, other information, but, but they don't track it to the individual like the sign-in um, systems do. So finally, I would like to acknowledge the um, generous um, data from MER that have been sent by many NDNS collaborators over the years and the support of the Mellon Foundation for Digital Humanities Grant that allowed us to begin um, archiving these data on open context and hiring the RShiny developer. The, uh, the Xseed platform is, uh, was used for hosting our, our RShiny project and our, um, and finally, our project in Jupyter Notebooks. Thank you. So uh, yeah, I guess we're going to kind of change directions here and, and move uh, move to the Near East now. So uh, the next uh, presentation is entitled Obsidian in the Near East, New Challenges and Future Directions. This is by Elizabeth Healy, Stuart Campbell, and Osama Maeda. So Elizabeth, please take it away. It's Stuart that's presenting. Okay. Yes, I, I got the short straw. Um, both Elizabeth and Osama are here and they've got their cameras on. So you should watch their faces as I'm presenting and watch for them to twitch when I say things they disagree with. Um, I want to do a fairly broad overview and talk on a number of, of different topics. They're, they're not really topics that I want to, or we want to set out as an agenda for Obsidian in the Near East as a whole. I must admit, this is very much a lab specific direction. These are some of the things that have come up in recent work, some of the issues that we can see going forward um, nicely. Uh, I should have started by thanking the organizers, but nicely, a lot of this stuff has already come up and been referred to one way or other in earlier papers. Um, over the last couple of days. So in many respects, I'll be rehearsing fairly familiar arguments um, within uh, a broader, broader context. But the first thing I really wanted to um, place in, this in the context of is that Near Eastern archeology span had a very early engagement with sourcing of archeological obsidian with the work of Renfrew Dixon and Cannes, particularly in the 1960s. And then for a long period, it was sort of trickling along where there was work continuing, particularly by the time of the seminal volume um, on the obsidian of the, the Near East edited by Mary Claire Covan, amongst others, that was published in 1998. By then, the sources were pretty well known. A lot of the broad patterns of obsidian use, at least during earlier prehistory, not so much in later prehistory, were well known, but the actual accumulation of samples had been relatively slow. So most sites, we were looking at a handful of artifacts that could pick out really broad patterns, but not the details of what were going on um, within archaeological periods and regions, individual sites, and so on. And that's changed very rapidly with an initial kick in the, the mid 2000s, with much larger numbers of samples suddenly started being produced. And then particularly an explosion of results from 2013, 2014, where particularly that most recent um, explosion in the number of results has come from the use as elsewhere of portable XRF instruments, including the sort of stuff that we've been doing in Manchester from about that sort of point. 
But it is, if you start looking where that's going in the near future, we're going to see a really rapid increase in the density of samples, number of samples, number of sites. Essentially, the point of that graph is that sample size, number of artifacts that have been assigned to source are increasing very, very rapidly. And that's going along with an increase in the number of people who are doing it, both in terms of more formally established labs and also in terms of people who have access to portable XRF machines and who are developing their own analytical program. Again, that's been referred to in previous presentations. And in many respects, the Near East isn't different from other parts of the world, but I think it's probably actually starting from a point where there isn't quite the quantity of material that's already been published. So we've got quite a lot we can learn by looking at how developments have, have occurred elsewhere. If you look at that on the map, this is a very inadequate map. The blue dots are an emerging geographical data set, but they're only remotely adequate for Mesopotamia and the Levant. As you move out from Mesopotamia and the Levant, there are lots of, of sites with analyzed material that we haven't listed there. And the Manchester contribution within that is a growing amount of both source and artifactual analysis. So both published and material that in some way is in a pipeline towards publication, we're now looking at about seven and a half thousand artifacts or a little bit more. We've actually tried to bias what we've been doing mainly to be looking at really large sample sets from individual sites so we can investigate the more um, specific, more detailed aspects of obsidian utilization. And in reference to Matt's earlier paper, perhaps, it's maybe worth mentioning one of the reasons that we've got material from over 100 sites is we've actually been reanalyzing quite a lot of the original Renfrew, Dixon and Cannon material, which is still in an archive. And as part of that, we've also been scanning and digitizing quite a lot of that Renfrew archive. It's been on pause for quite a long time now because it's not been possible to work on that material during COVID, but hopefully we can pick up on that again in the future. And that sort of increasing scale of data is demanding different approaches to how we go about integrating that material, analyzing that material. Things that are, are pushing beyond the classic report for which there's still a very strong role, of course, but the classic report of taking an assemblage of obsidian from a particular site assigning it to source and making that the core of a publication. So there's been the usual sort of range of approaches that you might expect, and one or two more innovative ones as well, looking at things like network models, routeway analysis, um, looking at comparisons between different groups of assemblages, and several of the people who are attending here have been closely tied up in, in some of these explorations of new tools to integrate and to develop new understandings of obsidian um, provenance data. In terms of sources, we've been in the situation for quite a long time now, where most of the sources are known in general terms. Our knowledge of subsources is gradually improving with relatively recent improvements, particularly at the major sources of Goluda in South Central um, Turkey and Nemrutda in Eastern Turkey. But there are other areas where we still lack a lot of information, both about subsources um, in particular locations, but very often where the, the form in which those sources would have been accessed by people in the past. So if you look at northeastern Anatolia, for instance, there may well have been quite a lot of accessing of material that's been washed along rivers, which essentially means that the river, in one sense, is a source of material, but it's sources that actually come from a number of different geologically distinctive sources. Renfrew's Group 3D, um, obsidian source, still unlocated. I was very pleased to see a mention of it in um, the Kurtik Tepe um, presentation um, yesterday. 
but it is something where we've been doing quite a lot of work on that, where, if I remember the figures correctly, there were known to be about 30 odd artifacts from the 3D source that by focusing particularly on later prehistory, so from the period from about 7000 BC onwards, we've actually been able to add from memory about 350 more examples. It's never a dominant source, but it is a source that becomes very, very regular employed, regularly employed in later periods. I think it's worth mentioning there are odd other unknown sources um, that occasionally crop up in archaeological material. And there are certainly issues around some of the smaller sources where they're not quite as well defined as we might expect. And in that context, I think particularly for people who are coming to obsidian source analysis for the first time in the Near East, there are major challenges around maintaining a full reference set and relating your material to the full reference set. And I think that's one of the challenges that we certainly encountered when we were starting out on this five or six years ago. I think we've largely overcome that. And as the earlier slide said, we're now working on a source reference set of more than 1,500 um, geological samples. But I think it is going to be challenging how other people can make use of that sort of material. The subsources, I think, are becoming particularly interesting and perhaps particularly with the example of Golodai East, where there are several subsources that are exploited at different times. There are various ways that you can go about starting to subdivide this. Um, and the diagram here is more for visual interest. It doesn't actually represent our subsource assignment process, which we're doing through five or six elements ratioed to a geometric mean. Um, but regularly, you can distinguish the Goluda 5 subsource. We're finding that there's quite a lot of overlap, particularly between Goluda 4 and Goluda 7, that make it a little bit harder to pull out. But once you start looking at regional patterns around that, you start to get things that suggest there are some quite complex and interesting things going on. So this is just looking at what's happening with distribution of Goloda East subsources down the Levant, where at some sites, you've got a domination of the Goloda 5 um, subsource, but at other sites, you've got other sources being used rather more commonly. Some of these may make a little bit of geographic sense. So sites to the, the west and the south of Goloda East are perhaps using more of the non Goloda 5, which is on the northeast end of the, the Golodar mountain range. So there may be something to do with geographic access going on, but there are a series of sites in the Rouge Basin, that you can see in red in the middle of the, the bar graphs, where they're not using nearly as much Golodar 5. And I think we're looking at quite complex distribution and access routes that, to be honest, we don't really understand at the moment. But I think there are going to be some very interesting things going on as these subsource patterns are better understood. One of the broad things that it's clear is happening within the, the Middle East is that through time, you get a greater diversity of sources that sites are utilizing obsidian from a wider range of sources, even if the bulk of the obsidian is still coming from a quite restricted number of major sources. And this is just an effort to plot that out using different ways of measuring diversity. Obviously, one of the big problems you've got is particularly for minority sources, if you only sample a small number of artifacts from a particular site, you're not going to be picking up the minority sources. So that when we've been looking at bigger samples from individual sites, somewhere like Umdabagia, where from memory we analysed maybe 700, artifacts, we actually picked up the last extra source somewhere around the 550th artifact. So there are various ways of measuring diversity that try and account for these missing minority elements. It varies a little bit between Mesopotamia and the Levant, but broadly speaking, somewhere in the mid seventh millennium BC, somewhere between 7,000 and 6,000 BC, you tend to get this kick 
of a much more diverse range of sources starting to come into play. We can see that very clearly if we look at a broad diachronic perspective of the change in obsidian use in Levant. And this is a fairly selected set of sites, but you can see at the sites that predate about 6,500, they're predominantly the pinks of um, the Cappadocian sources. And there afterwards, you go into this rather wonderful multicolored phase where you're starting to see sites utilizing a very much wider range of material, including some that still seem slightly counterintuitive. So the regular appearance at sites like Domastepe of quantities of obsidian from Armenia, when the route ways to access that would have probably run fairly close to the much bigger suppliers of sources like Bengal um, in Eastern Anatolia. So at Domus Tepe itself, you've got this huge diversity of sources, not just the three big sources, Golada East over here and the Bengal sources at other sites, Nemrut's the other major supplier that we tend to see, but you've also got lots of obsidian coming from Northeast Anatolia, where it's really quite confusing as to why that is coming in quite significant quantities. And our estimate is that about up to about 4% of this assemblage may be coming from those sorts of directions. And it's looking as though possibly in the region of Domastepe, if not the site itself, other sites in that general region, you perhaps have got that process of mixing of supply happening that then extends down the Levant because at that period, round about 6,000 or the first half of the sixth millennium, you also find a lot of the sites further down the Levant have also got a similar diverse set of resources starting to appear. So I think there are a lot of issues in terms of coming to terms with why the choices are being made, what minority sources represent, and how those supply routes are actually operating, where it's really only the increasing quantity of data that we've got that's allowing us to understand those sorts of patterns. But there's also important patterns that only emerge within individual sites once you start looking at larger assemblages that allow you to have a more contextual understanding of what's going on. Um, this is a site, Kenantepe, that dates to the early fifth millennium. It's actually very, very close to Kurtik Tepe that you were hearing about earlier during the conference, but it's several thousand years later. It's down on the, the Euphrates River. Um, there are two sets of trenches where material from the Obeid period from between about 47 and 46,500 BC were found. And those are trenches E and trench D. Trench D is fairly well known. There's a rather nice burnt building, and we know it was part of a whole sequence of buildings that were reconstructions of each other. So there's probably three, perhaps four phases of construction going on there, where I think we can possibly talk about a single household existing over several generations, occupying a building that undergoes a variety of modifications. Trench D overlaps that but only has only been excavated in the latter part of that phase. But bearing in mind that they're very close together, the fact that when we look at the totality of the obsidian that's come from those trenches, we get some quite interesting patterns going, going on. This, I would say, is not just based on geochemical analysis. Although we've analyzed over 800 pieces of obsidian from Kenantepe, with a degree of inevitability, the wood way these were originally selected, only about 150 of them actually come from the, the phases that we need to understand the household use of obsidian in these two trenches. So we've been forced to use visual characterization as well, which is why Nemrut and Bengal A are shown combined together. In fact, we do know that the vast majority of this paracline obsidian is almost certainly from Nemrut Dan. In Trench D, consistently during the phases that this, these series of households were building structures um, in Trench D, you're consistently looking at a paralkaline dominated assemblage, an assemblage that's largely dominated by material from Nemrut Da. 
In the neighboring tranche E that overlaps at the latter stages, instead it's being dominated by this group D obsidian coming from an unknown source, but it's probably somewhere not too far away from Kanantepi itself and between somewhere in the Nemruta and Bengal ridge. That starts to get very interesting once you start to think about that in terms of acquisition patterns. That it looks to us as though the two households are moving in different directions. That in trench D, the trench D household is particularly exploiting obsidian from Nemrut Da, perhaps by direct access, perhaps as part of um, seasonal and transhumans patterns, perhaps through intermediaries and by this time period, nomadic groups, nomadic transhuman groups are very possible. It starts to become interesting once you start to look at traditional migrant patterns in the area, which are surprisingly well documented from studies that were carried out during the 20th century, which suggest that there are patterns that particular tribal migration routes took people up towards Bengal, other tribal migration patterns took people up towards Nemrut Da, but some of them branched off and headed in the Moosh direction. And I wonder if that's going to be the sort of area that we end up discovering that 3D um, was present. But I think we're not just seeing a difference between households, but we're looking at the way in which households then map on to movement through landscape and other types of subsistence patterns in the surrounding area. It's worth saying that the Group D stuff also seems to be being brought back, and we've got the full reduction sequence going on at Kenan, while the Nemrut's material, for instance, seems to be coming back more in terms of paired cores or perhaps blades. So there are other differences going on there as well. That's intentionally not a, an attempt to give a large scale coherent overview. I did want to indicate that I think in many respects for obsidian studies in the Near East, this is a very exciting time. We've not only seen a vast increase in the amount of data that we're dealing with, but that's going to continue over the next few years where we're going to see an explosion possibly an exponential explosion in the terms of quantity of data that we've got to deal with. Although that is going to pose challenges in terms of non-traditional laboratories and analysts who are contributing to those data sets. I think we're certainly going to need to pay more attention to archeological context, as well as considering more traditional technomorphological analysis, where in a sense, obsidian studies and obsidian sourcing isn't a sub-study in itself, but it's part of the mainstream lithic analysis, which it hasn't tended to be within the Near East. Certainly comprehensive provenancing will give more balanced picture. We should get a much better idea of use of subsources, not just the main sources themselves. But I think we've got lots of challenges in terms of how we support this in a collaborative way. Um, perhaps particularly around access to samples, but particularly comparison between laboratories and ways of inviting individuals who've got time, who've got access to a PXRF machine, but supporting them in carrying out high quality and comparable data collection. Because that is the reality, that is the opportunity that's going to be there. And it would be against all our interests to, to try and stop it. I think the solutions that are certainly amongst the ones that we're wrestling with at the moment are going to be towards moving to much more open data and source sharing. The previous paper was very obviously opening up a lot of that sort of discussion. Um, we've very recently just started a repository using Figshare, really to try and get something up and running. But I think we're going to have to rethink the whole way in which we go about publication. And as Nico was saying, how we deal with the small data sets that aren't necessarily going to support top quality, exciting articles, but are still going to be valuable data sets and how we make them available in ways that can be credited, ways that can be referenced without holding them up 
as we wait for the final gold standard sort of publication to take place. And ultimately, I think we need to place this firmly back into an archaeological context that we're really ultimately interested in the interpretation and how we use this to understand the past. I'll leave it, leave it there. I do want to briefly reference the fact that we've got a web address that I'm inordinately proud of. Um, we will be making more material available on Figshare. There's nothing terribly exciting there at the moment, but we will be thinking about how we're going to develop that in future. So thank you for listening. Um, thank all sorts of people who've contributed to our project previously, but I'll leave it there. Thank you. Well, wonderful, thank you so much, Stuart. So uh, we've not heard from our next presenter. Uh, so we have some uh, free time here. Uh, so we have some time for questions for, for Stuart and uh, for any questions we might have for Nico as well. Yes, I have one question. Yeah. I'm Akira Ono. I want to make myself clear. What's the, <laughs> thank you very much for your presentation, but uh, what's the substantial difference between source and subsource, particularly, and as a terminology, but the subsource. I think. It's in in many ways. I I probably could more reasonably throw that out to several people who are much better qualified than I am to answer it. I must admit, we tend to use it in a rather informal sense. Mm -hmm and where it's more tied into the traditional nomenclature. So Golida has been, since um, the work of Renfrew Dixon and Cannon has been acknowledged as one of the major source areas. Um, there are various ways of subdividing it that relate to episodes of volcanic activity and particular flows, many of which are now better understood but I think we're perhaps particularly on the ones in the southern part of Galuda, I'm certainly not entirely clear exactly the, the sequence of deposition. In other cases, the name that should be used for the source, which is the name that I'm tending to refer um, to um, sources by, is the nearest modern place name and there are still areas where there hasn't been the de detailed geological work that's been done to disentangle the exact sequence of deposition and eruption of, of the obsidians. Um, so to be honest, I don't know. I'm, I'm using it loosely. There are going to be much more rigorous ways of making use of it. And I think over time, we ought to think about how we regularize that and how we standardize terminology. Yes, I, I need uh, maybe uh, much more discussion between archaeologists and geologists. Absolutely. <laughs> source and source. That's yeah, yeah no, I mean, ba basically, uh, the way we're using it is a bit of a mess. And I do apologize for that. No, 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 uh, it's OK. Thank you. No, that's a really great point. And, and I've noticed global differences. And in, in some people use terminology sources, subsources. <laughs> or groups and and I, I think it's kind of a central question of whether the geology is defining the sources or does the geochemistry define the sources and, and i think it's kind of a central question that's worth yeah. addressing yeah can i ask you a quick question uh i'm just wondering uh, can you uh, tell me the absolute date range so in general in in the near east where the use of obsidian gets in the peak so starts to the peak and it stays there and then going down so what is the range i mean in general picture let's say not of course not uh, really detailed but i mean what what, what you see uh, for your ex, uh, i mean for, with your uh, experience yeah and to to some extent it's got regional variations. So certainly areas that are closer to the source is obsidian gets used as a standard chipstone material and it declines largely either when the chipstone declines, 
or certainly there are places in Turkey where chipstone has been used fairly recently for thrashing sleds, which I think are mainly using chert because of the um, tougher um, wear that you can subject it to. Um, in a lot of places, you, the peak probably starts somewhere in the latter part of the eighth millennium. I mean, it's certainly, you get very regular and extensive obsidian use before yeah, that, yeah. but in terms of the most common appearance when it starts to make up the biggest percentage of um, obsidian. And that persists until maybe the middle of the sixth millennium in some places. Um, but one of the things that we've been finding that was a bit of a surprise is that most of the work traditionally on obsidian in the Near East has tended to be on the earlier part of prehistory. And it's not just that we've been discovering that the, the 3D obsidian has got a much more extensive use than we'd ever expected, but you've got obsidian use partly for things like beads and prestige material in Southern Mesopotamia, right the way into the second millennium. But there's a second millennium site right down in the Southern Mesopotamia where we've got a little classic little blade of obsidian um, dating to about 1500 BC. So it's, it's certainly not unheard of, even for quite utilitarian purposes, for a very long period. Um, I don't know. So th this is the sort of thing where I expect Elizabeth will, might, might want to give more detail. <laughs> or not. <laughs> I trust you. <laughs> <laughs> That's not very unwise. But of course, um, the the the, the blaze might be something symbolic. We we don't we haven't really addressed that. Yeah, no, that that is that is certainly true. But for for Moor, for instance, where they're very often unstratified, but they're typically be third or second millennium. Yeah, there are quite a number of obsidian beads, but there are also more apparently utilitarian items mm -hmm. as well. So there, there is a very long tail in terms of obsidian use. And I mean, Ellery's published that article fairly recently on obsidian found at Dura Europa in roughly Roman period. Thank you very much. Yeah. And also thank you for your presentation. It's really in inspiring and amazing. Thank you. I think it's very interesting that um, people are thinking along the same channels of, of making data available. And I think that's a very important thing to come out of the talks today. Yeah, and I think many of the many of the points that have been made earlier in terms of comparability and ref use of standards to both as secondary calibration and as a reference to mater for material is absolutely critical. I think you win with the uh, with the web domain there. Was that Manchester Obsidian Rocks? <laughs> I was, I must admit that not, not all of my cold <laughs> researchers have got quite the same feelings about it. I was so excited when I discovered I it like was it. a .rocks <laughs> domain name, which obviously was not set up for geologists, it's set up for the entertainment industry, but I was so excited about it. <laughs> Anyone who wants to copy it and also have something Obsidian Rocks is very welcome. <laughs> I, think I think Shree might. I'd have to discuss it at the IAOS meeting. <laughs> maybe there's a case for a mass takeover it may not have been intended as a geological domain name but that doesn't mean we shouldn't use it as one any other questions or comments so uh well, yes tristan Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, no, it, it was a terrific presentation and I very much want to um, 
yeah, I, I, I'm on board with all of those things. And I think it's incredibly important, uh, the, the return of the archaeological aesthetics to all of this and to treat uh, our material as archaeological artifacts and not samples. I think, you know, we, we now have this incredible computational power uh, and the recent turn to sort of social network analyses, et cetera, by Ibanez et al. and my old student, Zachary Batiste, they are all hampered by the reductionist attitude we have towards our material. Mm -hmm. All we're ever talking about in those models is raw material as opposed to how people are using it. And it's quite yeah. apparent that at the same time in different places, people are using exactly the same raw materials in very different ways. And we're losing all of that nuance with these representations. So, you know, the, the clear reportage of what your artifact is, stop calling them samples, call them artifacts. That's what we need to do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I think there, there's a slight almost ghettoization where as obsidian sourcing has kicked ahead, it's, although it's not the intention of anybody, it's actually taken it to a special place where people do obsidian sourcing. And it's sometimes taken it out of, out of the regular domain of the people working on the chipstone material from some of the sites. Oh, oh absolutely. And, and of course, there is uh, a very important space for that in terms of the initial definition of, mm. of sources, their discrimination, et cetera. But um, certainly, yeah, I mean, moving forward, I think obviously this isn't, you know, this is a comment of global pertinence here in terms of, you know, a, a return, a reintegration, you know, with, with our archaeological questions. Yeah. No, th this is great. So uh, we're now kind of moving into the uh, the lunch session here. So uh, we have a couple more presentations left. And uh, we're going to start off with a presentation by Kata Zlagi. Uh, the title of the presentation is Depositional Pattern of Obsidian Artifacts, Understanding the Diverse Value Concepts in the Neolithic Carpathian Basin. So Kata, uh, please take it away. Thank you very much. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank for the conference organizers to be here. Um, yeah, uh, hopefully, my screen is visible, right? Yes. Yeah, perfect. Um, yeah, um, in the beginning, I would like to, um, uh, sorry, one moment. Um, yeah, so in the beginning, I would like to um, uh, just mention the main objectives, what I would like to talk. Um, examine the exchange network in the, in, in the Neolithic Carpathian Basin, where the obsidian was one of the most important materials. I also would like to de-emphasize the economic angle of the obsidian and look more closely at the archaeological context and examine the depositional pattern of obsidian. Um, first, uh, just a look at this picture. Uh, we can see here the most prominent find categories of the Carpathian Basin uh, Neolithic period. Uh, we can see pottery, uh, polished stone axes, chip stone tools, and uh, very prominent uh, the obsidian. We are talking about oh, we are talking about the first farmers in the Carpathian Basin. Uh, in the, the Neolithic time, which means in absolute date uh, 6, 000, uh, from 6,000 to 4,500 uh, BC. And um, yesterday, uh, Clive Bonsal mentioned uh, this kind of Greek Hungarian plain and the Carpathian Basin uh, geographical uh, unit uh, tricky situation. That's why I would like to use um, during the whole presentation this little. Um, map which helps to understand better what kind of region what I'm I, I will talk about. Um, and in this uh, relative chronological chart, we can also see this kind of distinction between Transdanubia and Crete Hungarian plan. And um, in the map, uh, the red uh, means the Transdanubian part and the Great Hungarian plan. Uh, we can see uh, with the uh, blue one. And this is what uh, Clive Bonsai mentioned that uh, the southern part is actually Vojvodina, Serbia. So may, might be, uh, would 
uh, might be better to call, for example, Great Pannonian Plain, but that exactly means that when I'm talking about Great Pannonian Plain, I also uh, mean in Vojvodina and Serbian part. And the third uh, geographical unit in the Carpathian Basin is a yellow one, uh, which is the Transylvania or Hungarian language Erde, which is um, a Romanian territory. But uh, today I will not talk about in this uh, part. Um, so the prehistoric exchange networks, um, we talk about lithics and jewelry. And in the lithics, of course, the obsidian is highly uh, important and a different kind of flints in a Carpathian Basin context, um, the northern flint varieties are really important. That uh, consists of uh, Krakow Jurassic flint, Volhynian flint, chocolate flint, and uh, in the polystone axis, uh, the jade are super important. Uh, and the jewelry, uh, the spondylus, the lapis lazuli, amber, and the copper is, um, um, uh, yes, also important in the Carpathian Basin. And I would like to summarize in three um, bigger overarching questions what I would like to um, um, talking about. Uh, how is the obsidian related to other materials in the exchange network? A second one is, do the depositional pattern of obsidian vary in relation to the distance from the source? And the third one is, can we see differences between the use uh, uh, in domestic, burial, and ritual context? Um, first, uh, this uh, exchange networks in the Neolithic related to the obsidian, spondylus, and copper. And I would like to also mention the elaborate pottery, uh, why it's so important and related to the obsidian. Um, first, the, obsid the distribution of obsidian. Uh, Katalin Tibiro yesterday um, explained to us uh, the details and really the state of art and the research history of uh, the Carpathian obsidian, uh, the C1, C2, and C3. I just would like to refer her um, really interesting, good presentation. In the left map, we can see the chemical measurement, the, those obsidian finds which are uh, conf uh, confirmed by chemical measurement. And the right map is shows the distribution of ob the, the Carpathian obsidian by different kind of uh, archaeological uh, period. And we heard yesterday that from the Paleolithic to the uh, Iron Age and the also younger periods are uh, prominent. Uh, but mostly uh, how Catalin also uh, said yesterday that the middle and late Neolithic is the peak, the epoch of the obsidian. And the second uh, network is uh, the, uh, the spondylus. That's why I would like to use Arne Windler uh, maps um, in a 2019 uh, publication. What I a little bit modified to emphasize better the archaeological context of the obsidian. Uh, the green part shows um, the obsidian finds which uh, appeared from settlement context. Of course, it's not really surprising that close to the Mediterranean Sea, the coastline is um, the, uh, those uh, regions where um, it's um, um, concentrated in the settlement context. And if you are uh, going to the north and further to the continental part of Europe, uh, we can see that this archaeological context is definitely changed and uh, the spondylus uh, and spondylus ornaments and jewelries deposited in graves and some hordes. And it's very interesting to see these two regions were overlapping each other. This is the Carpathian Basin and Romanian and Bulgarian territories. Um, and if we look it closer in the Carpathian Basin, we can see that definitely we are talking about the Tisa River. I hope it's visible my uh, uh, cursor and um, uh, what I show uh, the Tisa River. Um, and it's also interesting that uh, the middle and late Neolithic, what I try to emphasize uh, from the obsidian perspective in the whole presentation. Um, so the uh, spondylus network concentrated uh, uh, along the Tisa River. And uh, beside the Danube, one accumulation is visible, which is actually in the late Neolithic time, uh, the Langel uh, culture uh, grapes which is also uh, here located uh, five, uh, five or six uh, settlements, which is really high number of uh, burials, but it's also 
So this is the reason why we can see there uh, this accumulation. And uh, if you're talking about the copper and the uh, distribution of copper, it's not so obvious the um, network uh, ro road, but, uh, uh, but the, the reason is because uh, the copper appeared in the late analytic in a very sporadic uh, way uh, from the burials. And we can see again, this land yell, um, uh, burials uh, accumulation, and also some bigger dots uh, beside the Tisa and um, the um, sub river of the Tisa. And why is important the pottery and uh, the distribution of po uh, book pottery? The book culture in the Cartesian basin in the relative chronological chart is the middle Neolithic, dated in the middle Neolithic. And um, if we see here in a little uh, map, and this is exactly what uh, in the last uh, uh, in the last few presentation we hear that uh, the Hungarian and Slovakian parts of the Tokai Hyperi Zemplin Mountain were concentrated the obsidian geological source and this is definitely the core area of the book culture. We can see here this really beautiful, highly decorated fine ware uh, vessels of book culture. So we are when we are talking about uh, the book pottery import. This is what we are talking about. And it's very interesting uh, because before we are talking about um, distant network, exchange networks, and now we are talking about some local things because I mean, that this is the first time in the Carpathian Basin where pottery was an item which was important and kind of item of an uh, exchange that was never before. Um, so that's why um, the point is that now we have to talk about what is the value, how a local uh, raw material, a local production became a valuable, exchangeable item, and what kind of values are necessary to uh, became um, or yeah, tra trans, um, transform an item or a raw material important for the other person, another community. So the value is a subjective concept which is um, determined by social interaction in real life context and thus variable and um, uh, culture specific. Nevertheless, it is uh, crucial to have an idea of how and in what ways and what kind of values and value systems govern prehistoric societies. There is a large amount of philosophical, anthropological and economical literature of the value concept. Uh, from all of them, I would like to emphasize uh, the marvelous uh, American anthropologist David Graeber uh, work, which is published in 2001, where he um, separated, and this is what I would like to use, um, three dimensions of value, which are determined by their involvement in different interconnected uh, spheres of human experience and which are archaeologically detectable. Um, economical, social, and ritual values. I try to help uh, in the uh, uh, further part of the presentation with these colors on the left side of the um, slide. Uh, the economic value, uh, the total sum of the amount of work, energy investment, the uh, skills put into the procurement and production of uh, things uh, might be detected using the following archaeological parameters. The distance between the item and its original raw material source, the ratio between the raw materials quantity and the source distance, nappable and usable qualities, the type or feature of a raw material procurement, and finally the completely uh, complexity of the technological production process of an item. Um, in the last three days, actually uh, we are talking about the economical value of obsidian mostly. Uh, we have a lot of really fantastic information, data, data set uh, in the different part of the world. And uh, that was really marvelous to, to listen to this uh, so huge uh, information the last some days. Let's say, uh, let's see the uh, social value. The ways in which things are integrated into social relations, the role play, uh, they play in interactions between uh, and within communities. The parameters are the origin from the different or distant cultural context, the outstanding grace and depositions, 
the degree of uh, specialization of technological process and the deposition context. The ritual value is actually the role items play in ritual practices most visible archaeologically in burials and depots. Parameters are the presence and frequency of the item in ritual depositions, the integration into patterns, and integration into sets. Um, I would like to um, use many examples from the LBK and also the Lengyel and Tisa cultures, which is the Middle and Late Neolithic, because this is the epoch of the obsidian. And let's see what we can see any traces from the obsidian perspective in a domestic, burial, and ritual context. Uh, I would like to start with the domestic context, context and um, I also would like to use a um, really interesting example from the biggest LBK site in uh, Europe. Uh, it's in Vrable in uh, Slovakia, which is the northern part of the Carpathian uh, Basin. And uh, I just uh, pick up one example and uh, from I mean, that one uh, house, and we can we can see that the local limnosilicite and the obsidian are the dominant uh, raw materials. And if we see um, the left side of the slide, um, the items, um, they place nothing really special, nothing a very specific retouching technique or something else. So it's totally normal. Uh, um, tools set uh, from the settlement. Uh, also at the LBK, but in the Hungarian part, but also uh, close to the uh, modern uh, part of the Carpathian Basin, Széchi uh, Nyújtetés and Karancság also rétek sites are, uh, uh, I would like to use an example. Uh, if you see the raw material distribution, the situation is the same, the obsidian and the local limnoquartzit or the limnosilicit. Um, are the dominant ones. But it's also interesting to see that actually the whole tool making procedure happens inside the settlement from the beginning. Uh, there are so many uh, decorticated plates in um, the um, uh, settlement material. So that means that actually the whole tool making procedure started from the obsidian nodules uh, form. Uh, also, the domestic, domestic context uh, in uh, Karanshag. Uh, site, which is uh, the late Neolithic part for the Lendia culture, totally the same, the raw material distribution. But the interesting uh, things, if we see the same co community, the Lendia community, but further from the obsidian uh, geological source, located in the southern part of uh, Transdanubia, and it's definitely change the whole raw material concept, which is the most important. The most important is the local metric radiolarite. And I help you here is the obsidian, which is 3% of the whole site from Ashwanyek Patasik. And the other uh, Lendia uh, materials, uh, which is uh, uh, um, published by Katalin Tibiro, is also a very, uh, very low amount of obsidian. Um, and what I would like to also emphasize, uh, the importance of the river. So uh, what we saw before that the spondylus and um, copper is uh, highly related to the Tissa River. Oops, sorry. The Tissa River. Uh, I also would like to use the same time period, middle late Neolithic, but focus on the Tissa. What, what's going on beside the Tissa? Winter culture and Tissa culture. I help here uh, with a little map. and. Uh, it's very interesting to see, for example, uh, the map of um, uh, uh, um, of uh, from the um, um, Marich publication from 2016. Uh, he emphasized that actually the C1 type of obsidian, the Carpathian one, is uh, distributed uh, uh, along the Tisa River, and actually all the same year, uh, Marina Milic uh, was. Um, a uh, person who def uh, who did a PhD um, in uh, the UCL University 2016, and she also emphasized that actually um, this uh, Serbian part and the lower Danube is uh, really interesting because probably this is the southern part of the Carpathian Basin distribution, and um, in these communities the obsidian was 
uh, important material, around 30% everywhere, uh, the amount of obsidian in Boryas and the Vršec sites, Podporan Kremenja, Podporanke, Gradice, Vršec and Opovo also, and we are just talking about C1. If you see the burial context and the LBK, also Vrable, uh, all in all 19 burials uh, uncovered in Vrable and seven burials have grave goods and two of them um, contain obsidian, a flake and also a blade. And also the burial context, and we are talking about not just now an economical value, I have to emphasize the social and the ritual value of these uh, obsidian items. Um, Tisa culture, it's close to the Tisa River, uh, late Neolithic, Polgatius, Holom site, only one blade fragment known from the uh, site. And also the Polgar microregion is really interesting. And we know one example from Polgar Ferenci Hat. Uh, the raw material published by uh, Margorzeta Kaczanowska and Janusz Kozlowski in 2016. Uh, the raw material distribution, same obsidian, local raw material, local limna quartz, but it's a really huge obsidian blade core appeared in the burial. And this is actually this kind of logical language jump in the next um, value um, appearance, this kind of ritual value, and also the depot and special deposition context, if you are talking about archaeological context, uh, the obsidian depots. Uh, from the early, early uh, Neolithic, a uh, new site uh, appeared in Vanchod, where we can see here, uh, published Anna Plishkin. Um, these are uh, obsidian nodules. The well known Nierlogosh uh, obsidian uh, blade depot from um, the Middle Neolithic, so it's also related to the Bug culture, which is C1. And Slovakia, we also know Kashov Chepegov site, uh, also C1 obsidian blade. Uh, unfortunately, the biggest part of the uh, here in the drawings, these uh, cores uh, appeared, uh, th these are spray finds. And this big one, uh, which published uh, Pierre Allard in 2017, this is actually appeared by, by accident. So that was a rescue excavation. We don't know so much about uh, the archaeological concept. But also the special deposition and again, ritual and, um, and the social value, what we are talking about, again, Vrable. Um, so the LBK uh, period. A house, and especially one post hole, were deposited in a very, um, very specific situation, a blade uh, core, uh, also C1. So it's definitely something uh, which is not just um, someone, I don't know, lost a blade. That was specially deposited in this post hole. That was the goal of the of this activity. And this is the same uh, in the late analytic context, Paul Gatchus Holon. This is a Tisa, Pell, and horizontal settlement. And uh, here also uh, an obsidian core uh, was deposited in, in a post hole in the horizontal part of the settlement. But if um, we are thinking about um, the uh, ritual value, we have to um, combine the obsidian depots with the other lithic depositions. Uh, that these are follow the same pattern, or the obsidian maybe uh, do something similar, uh, they do something totally different, and there is a special pattern. So just look at uh, shortly at from the early uh, early Neolithic Android site, we can see, which is published by Paolo Biaggi and Elisabetta Sarnini, 100 Balkan flint flakes deposited in a vessel. Middle Neolithic, again, book culture, Boldo uh, 6,000 blades, lim local limnoquacid blades deposited in a really huge vessel. And this is the same uh, beside, in, uh, beside the Tisa River in the late Neolithic, Segvartis Kvesh site, in a vessel deposited Sengai Radiolite, which means Bakoin Mountain, uh, Transanubia, 33 uh, pieces of blades. So from that perspective, that's really interesting what happened with the obsidian blade depot. And this is the time when I also would like to uh, make some conclusion about uh, the values, uh, what uh, we can see. First, the economic value of obsidian. Uh, if you remember the Lendia uh, period um, example, we have to say that not outstanding in every case, the obsidian, it's replaceable. Uh, 
further from the obsidian geological source, this material was not the most important anymore. The social value is actually, uh, if we see the obsidian appearance, we can see that no, really any, uh, not any connection with the high status burials. Probably um, uh, the, the analytic communities try to keep um, in a living, for a living communities, uh, the obsidian, because that was a very interesting uh, and very important part um, of um, between the communities, it, it was an exchangeable item. And this is actually to have it, uh, to be able to keep the interest between communities. And the third, the ritual value, actually, we can see that uh, the obsidian treated differently than the other lithic materials. We see the distinct pattern of the deposition, that, which is totally different from other raw materials. And this is a clear pattern, the core and the deposition. It's definitely a clear pattern, which is um, uh, this reveals that there are different value systems according to which obsidian could be understood. And that's why it's, uh, I wanted to emphasize that these value systems are diverse, multidimensional. One item and one raw material could have had different kinds of value at the same time. Uh, the current value of an item is related to the depositional, means archaeological context. Uh, to understand the diverse value concepts, we need to study and pay attention to the different depositional patterns. Thank you for your kind attention. Well, thank you, Kata. Uh, maybe we'll just have time for a quick question. All right, well, why don't we, why don't we move on here uh, for our next presentation, or like it's the final oral presentation. Uh, it's entitled Obsidian Sourcing and the Study of Island Colonization by Tristan Carter. Three, which is gonna be in Japan and they've got a wonderful program prepared for everyone. So uh, Dr. Ono, please uh, take, it, take it away. Thank you, Kyle. <coughs> then I'll make uh, short information about the next conference. Well, Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, dear colleague. I'm Akira Ono, a scientific committee member of the International Obsidian Conference and a local organizing committee member of IOC Engel 2023. First of all, first of all, I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to all the participants of this conference and in particular for the local organizing committee member of Berkeley conference Kyle, Nico and Lucas. Thank you very much indeed. In these three days, I've joined and heard and see the presentation, not exactly, but nearly 40 presentations, including post session. And there I found great variety of geological, analytical, and archaeological topics. And uh, this extensive and Intensive and extensive researches are representing new horizons of obsidian studies from all over the world. And then we would like to succeed and proceed these fruitful results to the next conference, namely IOC Engel 2023. And uh, here I have pre-recorded a video presentation message of Mr. Sasaki, Shuichi Sasaki, the mayor of Engel Town. So I would like to share 
put the message first, and after that, I put just some information. Mr. Uh, Mayor Sasaki speaks his message in Japanese, and you see the English translation under the screen. And here we go. エンガル町代表 案内の御挨拶をする機会を与えられましたこと、誠に名誉に存じます。日本の北海道日数エンガル町には日本国内で最大の国用石産地赤石山と後期旧石器時代の石器製作遺跡白滝石群があります。赤石山では今から220万年前
lastly, uh, I do hope that we would like to see you again in Engeltown in 2023, and hopefully not by virtual conference, but face to face. Thank you very much. Well, wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Rano. This really looks like an amazing program, and, and uh, I'm really excited to these wonderful sources and, and, and take part. So, so thank you for putting that together, and I'm excited, yeah. as I'm sure many of you are. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, on the schedule here, we have our, our poster session. Uh, we're all, we're going, to, then going to come back at 3.30 for closing announcements. We're going to announce our poster winners, uh, the SAS and IAOS poster winners. Uh, we'll also uh, talk about a future publication of the proceedings of this conference and, uh, and closing announcements. So uh, be sure to go visit some of the posters in the, in the designated poster rooms, and we'll be back at 3.30. So thank you. Taylor Student Poster Award which acknowledges innovative student contributions to archaeological research through the use of scientific methods. Uh, the award is, uh, is named in honor of the late Emerit Professor Emeritus R. Irvin Taylor of the University of California, Riverside, for his out outstanding contributions in the development and application of radiocarbon dating in archaeological research and his many contributions to the Society uh, for Archaeological Sciences. Uh, the, the award itself comes with a $100 uh, reward award and a complimentary year-long SAS membership and a subscription to the SAS Bulletin. And uh, this year's uh, winner is Benjamin Smith for his paper uh, entitled Imports and Outcrops, Characterizing the Bantu Obsidian Quarry Wolotai, Ethiopia using PXRF. So right. congratulations, Ben. And Ben is here. Hey, Ben. <laughs> So uh, I'll be in contact with you, Ben, and, uh, and we'll work out the details. And the check's in the mail. Che check is in the mail. <laughs> PayPal check is. That was uh, my next question. No, thank you very much. Yeah, it was a great poster. Yeah, we're really excited to have the, the posters, the poster awards here. Um, this is the first time we're, we're giving out the Craig Skinner Award in honor of his, uh, of his um, long, multi-decade contribution to obsidian studies and uh, we're going to be uh, advocating that that poster award move forward at various venues various conferences including the 2023 IOC conference that's great well thanks Lucas I, I, I tend to be around for lots more of those research years <laughs> well, we're, we're really happy to have your contribution um, we we lean on on your research a lot uh, in California and in Great Basin archaeology as you know I'm you know. glad to hear uh, okay, so just a few items um, before we have a post-conference uh, cocktail virtually, if, if you are interested in staying on a little longer. Uh, we wanted to, to note that, um, as many of you probably know, the program that was accessible to everybody may have had a few typos, uh, may have had some authors that weren't listed or listed in the wrong order. We're going to make some corrections to the final program, so it is posted and represent what actually occurred and, some, and correct some of the, the issues. Videos will also be archived on the ARF projects page and the IAOS page um, in the coming weeks. Uh, Nico and I and Kyle are gonna spend some time and, and edit that video down um, to make it as, as clean as possible. Uh, there were a few papers that were not uh, that it, were not recorded for their request. And I wanted to extend that to all of you that if you choose to not have your paper as part of the recording, just send us a quick request and we can simply edit it out. If you, if you choose to not be part of the video, we um, um, The posters are really only exist in that PDF that was sent out. We aren't gonna post them anywhere else. Um, but we do encourage the poster presenters to, um, to contribute to the IAOS bulletin. Many of those posters would make nice uh, reports or short essays. 
which the bulletin is a really good venue for those kinds of publications, especially ones that are in progress. There, um, some of those posters may end up uh, being full length articles uh, in, in the ARF uh, proceedings. So we will, um, we can discuss that too. Um, so with that, we, we are gonna send out um, at least one to potentially a few post-conference emails with links to things, news about what's gonna happen after the conference, including the plan for uh, the proceedings to be published through UC Berkeley, through the Archaeological Research Facility. Um, so please keep your, your, um, uh, your eyes and ears out for those emails. The Obsidian 2021 at Gmail email will be active for, for many months. So we will still receive emails through there and I'll be checking those um, daily, if not weekly. If you have any post-conference questions, um, and with that, I really look forward to seeing everybody in Japan. Mm -hmm. And um, please feel free to stay on for a post-conference cocktail or a beer or just a, a, a casual chat, if you like. Yes, but thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you all. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Well done, guys. Lucas, Fire, and Nico. And I'll, I'll stop the recording while we have a cocktail. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea. Yeah, hide the evidence. <laughs>